story. Uh, you look at the, the narrow path, you know, almost a uh, very difficult path that Obi will have to take uh, to make the headway. Remember that it's about, it's not just about the popular vote, it's about also the spread and the percentage. And the structure. And, yeah, so it's, it's, it's talking to that. And if you look at the crisis in APC, the problem of even acceptance, uh, the crisis of records, the kind of stories that we're doing around the records of Buhari and, and the APC administration, a lot of people not really willing to say we are going to go that path again. You begin to understand that, yes, there must be some truth in the polls that we had yesterday. So, But the backlash are in place. Uh, people must react. You can't take away the uh, five governors fighting their party. I mean, that's... Uh, As, exactly. And I think the Sun newspaper is leading yeah. with that, yeah, saying yeah, that um, the five governors uh, would decide on where... We, one of the papers leading with that story. The five governors this would decide on where... Uh, to pin their tent. And a lot of people saying that they probably will go the way of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, that they will follow whatever Obasanjo asks them to do. But it's also doubtful if, uh, you know, governors can decide uh, how their states vote. That's it. Thank you so much, Emmanuel Bello there. Uh, well, that's the press preview. Let's hear your view on all the burning issues. Follow us on Twitter at Arise TV. You can join today's conversation using the hashtag at Arise Day Break. And that's it for today. Up next in the morning show, it's a full day ahead. And every moment indeed matters. I am ED Amuga. Thanks for watching. And I'm Kitchen Nana. Goodbye. Everybody wants more. More strength! More knowledge! Uh -oh. I just want more of anything that is good for my family. That is why I use Tasty Tom and Rich Tomato Mix. It's thick and gives my meals an appealing red color. It helps me cook delicious meals. And what's more, it's enriched with vitamins and fiber that are good for the body. What more could a mother want? Please give me more. Mommy, I want more! It's time you try Tasty Tom Enriched Tomato Mix because it's enriched with vitamins and fiber. Tasty Tom, for tasty meals good for you. Available in convenient sachets that are easy to open and easy to store. Getting together for the first time in years was uh, a little bit awkward. Grandpa still tried to entertain us. Mom was always in the spotlight from the kids. It wasn't until Grandma cracked a joke. That's my father right prayer. That we got back into our groove. In this festive, DSTV is making family time even better with an upgrade. Stay connected to DSTV and we'll upgrade you to the next package for free. analyzes the decisions that affect all of our lives. A very warm welcome to you. This is News Night. Every night, we bring you the moments that matter, from the top to the bottom, and in every corner of our country. We bring you a focused agenda from Nigeria, Africa, and beyond. Focus on what's important with Arise News Night. Knowledge is power. Information 
is currency. Trust us to tell you what you need to hear. Welcome to the program. You're with Arise News in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Breaking news, exclusive interviews, unrivaled analysis. It's you, the audience, who drives our agenda. We tell the stories that inform you, the stories that are important to you, and the stories that are about you. We are not every news channel. We are Arise News. Good morning, other. You're watching The Morning Show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. I'm Ayo Myro Essay. And I'm Rafael Senior. We've got a great show lined up for you for the next three hours. So sit back, relax, and let's keep starting your day because The Morning Show begins right now. As the year 2022 gradually comes to an end, all eyes will be on Nigeria as it prepares for its general election in early 2023. There are some reasons for the optimism that the upcoming polls will be an improvement on the 2019 election. First, President Buhari has strongly signaled that he wants a credible, transparent electoral process to be an important part of his legacy. Yesterday, this day newspapers released the 2023 election projections were a breakdown of how the top four candidates, namely Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, Bola Chinubu of the All Progressive Congress, Labour Party presidential candidate Pito Obi, and Rabi Musa Kwankwaso of the New Nigeria People's Party will perform in the six geopolitical zones in the country. Some of the factors responsible for the new realities include the presence of the candidates in each of the states, their structures and support base, capacity to mobilize the contents of their respective manifestos, ethnic sentiments, their popularity and name recognition, as well as financial war chest. Joining us on this show later this morning as we break down the projections by these day newspapers is Dr. Sam Amadi, a rights news analyst, and Professor Antony Kila, a professor of strategy and development and director at the Center for International Advance and Professional Studies. Moving things along, we shall be bringing you a special report on security in Nigeria as we highlight some of our shortcomings in this year in securing lives and property and some measures the government put in place to tackle the issue of the insecurity in the country. Well, let's catch up on news making headlines across the globe. Michael Wilson will give us an update on global business outlook, while Rod Studio will update us on Africa business activities across the continent. We'll also review today's newspaper with the rising Zionist and Menu Hafeni Wala Giokma will fill us in on what's trending around the world. It's going to be all that and a whole lot more today on The Morning Show. Welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. The presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, yesterday won the River State Governor Yusom Wika and his embattled colleague governors in the party against their plot 
The dumping for a rival presidential candidate saying any such decision will end their political career. This as the five dissenting governors were selected in Abia State Wednesday to participate in the 2022 edition, edition of the Igbo International Christmas Retreat slated to hold in Omaya, Abia State. Speaking through one of his campaign spokesmen, Senator Dilo Melaya, Tiku affirmed that no envy or blackmail will detract him from his aspiration towards winning the presidency next February. Meanwhile, the five aggrieved governors of the People's Democratic Party have returned to London, the United Kingdom, to finalize their decision on who to back for the presidency in the 2023 general elections. The five governors are Yisum Wiki of River State, Samuel Atom of Benway State, Shei Makinde of Oyo State, Ifa Nguanyi of Enugu, and Akhiz Yekwazo of Abia State. The governors are canvassing for the resignation of BDP National Chairman Iyocha Ayu before joining the campaign for the party's presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar. I mean, a lot to talk about this morning. Yes. <clears throat> so as we inch closer to February 25, which is the date of the presidential and national assembly elections, the PDB crisis doesn't seem to be waning. Unfortunately, it seems the crisis seems to be deepening as we see reports that they haven't come to a consensus or perhaps a sort of um, agreement as to how to solve this lingering crisis. So as was reported, as you know, Ufai has mentioned, uh, they've said that Sino Senator Dino Melaye, one of the spokespersons of the PDP, had said, and I quote directly from him, Attacking Atiku will cost them their political future. You don't fight a man who has done nothing to provoke you. Atiku's only offense is that he won a presidential primary transparently and openly. No man should play God. Let's look at that statement for a second. So, yes, um, having won the presidential primaries, which, by the way, the governor of River State, Nyerson Wiki, had contested and lost to um, Atiku Abubakar. And then um, following that, uh, Governor Nyerson Wiki had said, Said that then come up with the fact that they had the party chairman as well as the presidential candidates of the PDP were both from the same geopolitical zone. And in the spirit of fairness, equity, it shouldn't be so. However, the, um, Atul Kabubaka has also come out in, in the past to say that in order to change this, they're going to ha it's a constitutional matter whereby, according to the PDP constitution, if they're going to remove the national chairman, which is Senator Yocha Ayu, they're going to have to then move up the deputy national um, chairman, who also happens to be from the northern geopolitical zone, and then on and on like that. And that in the, with the brevity of time, what they should do is that let us come to an agreement and then following, let's focus on the elections. Post-elections, we can then begin to settle the things, the issues or the matters that they have. Put this side by side that a number of other PDP big wigs, you know, PDP chieftains have called the parties in question, uh, the, the five governors who formed the G5 and then on with the integrity group with other um, party um, um, chieftains have come up to say, that, OK, let's have a conversation. We're hurting the party. We're hurting our election or our chances if we continue to promote this internal wrang wrangling. Now, beyond Wiki's reason, which is that um, from the same pol geopolitical zone, um, Governor Samuel Otom of Benway State has also said that it's not fair to have two Fulani presidents back to back, citing the example of President Tulisha Gombasanjo, who even in the spirit of fairness backed Mari, um, um, Musa Yaradwa instead of James Ibori saying that it was time to move from the south to the, um, to Peter Dili, my, my apologies, instead of move, to move from the south to the north. And they said in the spirit of fairness, so this is what they've pushed for. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem as if um, the presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, is willing to move, neither are the G5 party members willing to move. Now, in terms of hurting their political future, I believe instead, Senator Dino Melaye should see how the division in these parties would hurt President, the presidential candidate, and the PDP as a whole in the forthcoming elections. What has been said by analysts in the past is that if the PDP presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, is seen not to be able to manage the political difference or the differences within members of his party or bring unity in the party, how then can he be trusted to manage um, the nation with the complexities of, uh, of, our, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the feelings of the people in Nigeria? And so these are some of the questions that have come up that sort out your party. A party divided, a house divided cannot stand. 
As long as these internal wranglings continue to distract from the main issue, it, it, the, the confidence in the party and the party's ability to manage conflict comes into question. Indeed, Shea McIndale, during their PDP Southwest stakeholders meeting in Ibadan uh, earlier this year, in September of this year, says, if we want to unify Nigeria, we must unify PDP first. If we want government of national unity, it must reflect in PDP. Unfortunately, it's not currently reflected in the PDP. So, for these governors, the G5 governors, and the presidential candidates, and the chairman of the party, Senator Yocha Ayu, the big question for them is, are they willing to sacrifice the chances of the PDP, because as we said yesterday and from the um, these day reports, uh, um, projections, it's a very close tie. We're looking at going to a runoff election. And so it could be very, you know, the margin is quite close that every single factor matters. It is important. Therefore, the, the, part, the parties involved should ask themselves, would they be willing to sacrifice the PDP's chances at the elections come February and March? on the altar of differences within the party, or should they, for the interest of party, bury the hatchet? And not to forget that they're now saying that they've gone to London to determine the next course of action so that they come out you know, with the united front as to who is their anointed member, you know, anointed candidate to support towards the presidential election if they do not support their own party um, candidate. As Dr. Bassi often says, it is, and as the reality is, it is anti-party activity. Would they be willing to exit the PDP if they do go on, go ahead to choose another presidential candidate from a separate party? These are questions, unfortunately, no answers yet, and we'll continue to see this unfold in the coming days. Dr. Bassi? Well, what are the issues here? <clears throat> One, the uh, G5 governors, as they are called, the dissenting, aggrieved governors who are members of the People's Democratic Party and the larger group called the Integrity Group, which includes uh, party chieftains, including some of the founding fathers of the party, are saying that the irreducible minimum for cooperation and peace and solidarity in the People's Democratic Party is for Senator Yoshi Ayu to step down as chairman of the party. What is on the ground is that Dr. Yochi Ayu had already been given a vote of confidence by the uh, party, the board of trustees, and other stakeholders within the party. So Governor Yesum Wiki, who is leading the rebellion, uh, and the integrity group, and the other governors, they are talking about equity, fairness, and justice. And they're saying that if the party does not shift. If Yoshi Ayu does not step down, they are not going to campaign at the presidential level for the People's Democratic Party. And at the same time, they do not intend to leave the party. Now, so the situation now is that these same governors are in London having a, part, a, a meeting to decide who they will support, which presidential candidate they will support in January. And there are speculations that their announcement will be made latest January 5. Well, I don't know why London is so attractive to them. They're going to waste, spend money in London, money that should be put into the Nigerian economy here, even if it is a bottle of Coca-Cola and a pepper soup that they will take wherever, you know, they choose to meet. But they are taking the, that money to London. But that's by the way. Now, nobody will be surprised if they decide not to back... Uh, Atiku Abubakar, the presidential candidate of their party, to be consistent with the position that they have taken. Where the dilemma lies is, would they back P2B or would they back uh, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinumbu of the APC? If they go either way and they abandon their own presidential candidate, that will be clearly an anti-party activity. And what will be the position of the board of trustees, which has the powers determine whether a person has gone against the party and should be expelled from the party. But Wiki has said, well, if anybody wants to expel them, they are ready, they are prepared. So in other words, the PDP, whatever decision uh, that uh, the uh, integrity group takes by January, is facing a crisis, is going to that election with a crisis among the ranks. Would the five governors be influential enough to make any difference the party does not think so. And hence, Dino Melaye, speaking for Atiku Abubakar, issued a statement yesterday saying 
that the political career of those governors will end if they do not uh, support Atiku Abubakar, and that we thought without them, uh, the party is going to win the election anyway. Well, I don't know about uh, anybody's political career ending. Uh, people can always reinvent themselves. People can always make other choices. So nobody should predict the destiny uh, of anybody in terms of politics. But the position that has been taken by the party is that the party can and will win the election with or without the G5 governors and the integrity group. This was a position that was articulated yesterday by Senator Dino Milaye, by Kola Ologmodinyo, who even went a step further to say, look, it doesn't matter what the posters or the uh, governors are saying, Atiku will win in more than 24 states uh, and get 25% in more than 24 states. This same statement, uh, similar statement was made by uh, Eddie Olafeso in Ekiti yesterday at the inauguration of the Presidential Campaign Council of the PDP in Ekiti. This same statement was made by Timothy Osadolo, Deputy uh, Youth Leader of the uh, People's Democratic Party, who says that Wiki and members of the G5 are not even in a position to talk about trust or loyalty. This same statement, more or less, was made by the Acting Board of Trustees Chairman, uh, Senator Adolfo Swabara, uh, you know, who was speaking uh, somewhere also in the East yesterday during the inauguration of the PDP Presidential Campaign Council. So what's, what would be a major surprise would be if the G5 governors endorse Atiku Abubakar and they say they reconsider their position. That would be the big surprise. The alternative would not be surprising at all. However, Chief Olabode George, the leader of the party in the uh, Southwest and in Lagos State, has responded to the possibility that Atiku and uh, the party say, well, the integrity group, they can do whatever they like, the party will move ahead. Chief Olabode just says, well, he hopes that uh, Waziri Atiku Abubakar remembers how the party was established and that he wishes him luck if he thinks that he can win election without the G5 governors and the integrity group. And that, you know, even if he wins, it's not a problem. He's speaking for himself. we we'll just say, uh, you know, we'll go back to his house. But in any case, in all of this, you know, it doesn't make the People's Democratic Party look good. But you can also say that Wike and Co, they may just be grandstanding, thinking that they can determine the outcome of the election. The outcome of that election, whichever way it goes, it will be determined by the people of Nigeria, the electorate. And presidential candidates should put their faith in those presidential, uh, in, those, in the electorate. And all these messages we keep getting, some people saying they will determine who will be the president of Nigeria, whether it is G G5 or is uh, Chief uh, Ato Eze uh, uh, putting down uh, uh, Peter Obi's ambition? The people must get their PVC. When you have a permanent voter's card, you, the electorate, should take the power to determine who becomes president. And it's only if you have your PVC and you come out on election day that you can create this situation, uh, prevent this situation whereby some people think that they have the power to determine who the next president should be. No individual or one group should wield such power over how many voters? 95 million 90 registered million voters. Million. voters. You see, <clears throat> when I look at what is happening, I laugh at both parts, the G5 governors and the PDP. When politicians try to talk about fairness, it's akin to Lawrence Nomadja Kwanini leading an anti-robbery squad. We both know what, we all know what has happened in the PDP. It is a struggle for power. One group did outdo the other. Mr. Wiki had been spending on the party all this while. Then he saw a bigger power in Mr. Atiku that muscled in out in the presidential race. And now he feels disgruntled. Nigerians, shine your eye. It's a power play between two top gladiators. It is not your fight. They will settle when their interests align. Mr. Wike thought he owned the structure of the PDP before. But Mr. Tiku wrestled him out. And he feels disgruntled. So when they try to put you in their fight, remember it's about these two people. 
And the earlier you remember that, the better it is for all of us. So when they talk fairness, yes, there's an element of fairness in the argument. If it goes not, it should come south. That's the balancing. But it's these same politicians that today they will tell us that there must be religious balancing, geographical balancing, and tomorrow they will see another thing because it's about their interest. And that's why if you are wise enough, the best way you can break their back is to vote. Get your PVC. Be smart. Concerning the man that said another man's political career will end. <laughs> I laugh. Mr. Vincent to Bula for once said PDP will rule for the next 60 years in this country. The PDP didn't live to see the next election cycle. What does that teach you? No man is anybody's God. Didn't they say Mr. Timmy Prius silver political career was over at a point when he left the governorship in Bayasa State? Is that not the same Mr. Timmy Prius silver that is Minister for Petroleum Resources now? Minister, no of man, State. Minister of State for Petroleum Resources. So that's to show you that no man is any man's God. No man can determine anybody's political career. Don't let politicians deceive you. Shine your eye. Labour Party has appointed Akio Shutoku as the new presidential campaign director general. He replaces Don Yokupe, who resigned from the post after he was convicted for violating Money Laundry Act. National chairman of the party, Julius Abure, announced his appointment in Abuja. Prior to an appointment, Oshidoku had been the former managing director of the new JDG of Nigeria's party zonal coordinator, South. He also served as political advisor to former President Olucho Gwebasunjo as well as director of presidential campaign of the People's Democratic Party in 2011. He is the most senior uh, officer in the campaign council after doing it. And so all of these variables were put into consideration before we inevitably arrived at this conclusion. We believe that he has the capacity, he has the competence to join us in this campaign and be able to drive this campaign to success. Now, campaign strategy has not changed. It remains the same thing. Trying to say a new Nigeria is possible. We can build a new Nigeria. We can build a new Nigeria where Nigerians are happy, where Nigerians have a means of livelihood and live in their nation. Hopefully, that things will get better because hope is what drives every process. To I am. Yes, congratulations, Balogun Professor Akin Oshutoku. Um, Rufa, you've already talked about his uh, pedigree. He said, I, I have political activism and politics in my blood. Mm -hmm. and, and fair enough, because his dad, uh, the chief Odola uh, Oshutoku, was a minister in the First Republic uh, from 1955 to 1966. So he's grown up you know, from a pedigree of politics. And he himself, prior to, to being in politics, had been in media, he'd worked with The Guardian, he'd um, also, as you, as you mentioned, Rufai, been the managing director of the news agency of Nigeria. And only in August of this year, defected from the PDP to the Labour Party. And obviously, because of his, uh, his, his track record, his pedigree, was made the leader of the Southwest. And consequently, now that uh, Mr. Donyo Kupe has had to step aside in a, in a move that many people praised as being, um, dig as being dignified and the new face of politics, perhaps, in Nigeria. We've seen now that um, um, Mr. Aki, Aki, Balogun Aki Oshitokun is now the director of the Labour Party's presidential campaign. He has his work cut out for him, as, and in the coming days, we'll begin to see that. It's a very short time towards elections, but of course, we know that when it comes to elections, every second, every minute, every day matters. He has, in, in terms of deepening the influence of the Labour Party. Thus far, in terms of the work that Mr. Dunyo Kupe did, a number of people have praised his efforts in terms of the perception of the Labour Party by the electorate. They've seen popularity, especially amongst young people, and they've been able to maintain that in the last few um, days and months. It is now for um, Mr. Shizoku Tubalogun Shizoku to 
to build on that work and to ensure that they continue to uh, deepen as well the influence. The only, only other thing I'll mention is uh, perhaps does this then mean that it is speaking louder that the former president, Ulushen Obasanjo, is going to stand with the Liberal Party uh, presidential Party. candidate? Okay, I think uh, Mr. Peter Obi could not have made a better choice. From the point of view of strategy, Oshinto Kun is a good choice. Oshinto Kun is uh, a tested war horse. Uh, he was director general of the uh, 2011 presidential campaign of the People's Democratic Party. And at that time, uh, Dunyo Kupe, whom is succeeding, was in the PDP. Peter Obi himself was in the PDP. Uh, but, you know, in terms of experience also, he has had significant experience uh, managing political processes and also institutions. He was managing director of the Odua Printing uh, Press uh, in Ibadan at the time. He was also managing director of the News Agency of Nigeria. He's been a political advisor to uh, President Olusegun uh, Obasanjo. As he pointed out, he's been, uh, you know, in many other uh, battles, political battles. On top of it is Balogun of Kemesi. The Balogun is the war commander for a community. So Oshintokun agreeing to go to war uh, on behalf of uh, P2B, uh, you know, is understandable. Beyond all of this, uh, it brings to it very solid education, very solid experience and capacity to network. Why it's also strategic is that he had been the coordinator for the P2B campaign in the South. So what Peter Obi has done is to replace one Yoruba man with another Yoruba man as a way of also deepening his influence and reach uh, within the uh, Southwest. So that's strategic. It will have been odd if you are taking a, you know, a director general from another zone. So that's consistent. Now, on top of all of this, well, Oshuto Kui himself uh, knows that uh, you know, politics is a tough game. He writes on it every week. He's a political scientist. Uh, by the way, by training from the University of Lagos. So, and he has had the opportunity to put his ideas into practice. And for those who may be criticizing him, he's one of those Yoruba leaders who insist that power must come to the South and that it is a turn of Igbos. So the decision to accept the appointment is also an ideological one. It's also one in terms of principle. I've had the opportunity to discuss this with him many times, but he says, no, it's a matter of principle. The presidency must come to the south, and it must go to the east, if we all believe in the idea of fairness, equity, and justice. So, Oshutoku, you've taken this ideological choice. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very sure that we'll put in your best. We wish you well. Congratulations. I mean, what else can I say uh, than congratulations to him? And in the words of uh, Taishula Arani, I say, may your road be rough, sir. Because uh, if your road is not rough in life, you will not be able to make appreciable gains in anything you venture into. May your road be very rough at this time. But one thing is certain, that he's going to bring a lot of experience, strategy, forthright thinking, clarity of thought, and intellectual dexterity to the campaign. If you read his back page, you will know that this man has a lot of clarity of thoughts, and he has stability as regards conviction, which is a rare trait in this our political time. Most of our politicians are very unstable in their conviction. In fact, I call it a conviction of called anywhere belefacism. As long as the best money comes to the best pocket, the conviction will change. It is conviction of pounds and dollar that they know. And that is what has heralded our political scene. But uh, Mr. Akinyoshitoku is somebody that has been steady in his conviction. And that makes Keti man. You hardly see men that are steady in their conviction, especially in the day and age where the dollarization of the Nigeria economy, quick gains from government, has heralded the thinking and the cerebral faculty of a lot of people. The phenomenon of called Asha Adyong has eroded the thinking faculty of people, and they don't think straight any longer. So we'll keep looking, and uh, we'll keep inquiring, 
And uh, one thing I can tell him for free, Mr. Ashutogun, anytime you get out here, we interrogate you. We will interrogate you steadily and objectively because now you are in the arena. But may your road be rough. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break. We will return when we have uh, Michael Wilson and Rod Sodiri to give us updates on global and African business activities. Stay with us. from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. For Global Business Audit, Michael Wilson joins us now from Cape Town, South Africa. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Um, Asia markets are uh, fairly mixed this morning, um, looking at headwinds really for 2023. None of that's going to be resolved um, anytime soon. Um, Hong Kong's up very, very slightly on the fact that, as I reported yesterday, China has scrapped its quarantine um, for incoming incoming tourists. But the Shanghai, the, 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 the Shanghai Composite um, dipped very, very slightly. The Nikkei down as well, about half a percent. Um, the Chinese electrical vehicle maker NIO has um, cut its delivery guidance for the quarter four. It was said it was originally going to deliver about 48,000 cars. That's been brought down to 39,000 and the stock's down 8%. This is a direct um, pr uh, problem as far as uh, not, not so much supply chains, but more the COVID um, shutdown. As far as the United States is concerned, um, a, a relatively flat week um, in prospect, uh, really. Um, a slight rise in normal trade from the Dow, but generally speaking, futures relatively relatively flat and I think we're going to go out of 2022 with a bit of a whimper quite honestly. However, Tesla is not. Tesla shares down 11% yesterday since the beginning of the year down well since the record high down about 73% and this is all to do with shutdowns in China, um, Musk and his rather messy acquisition of Twitter, um, perhaps spending too much time at Twitter 
and people and is struggling to find buyers in China and the United States as we speak. So there's a stock which was doing extremely well and now not so well. Um, new sanctions are beginning to bite Russia now. This is according to the, finan the finance minister, Anton Siluanov, who spoke, there he is, who spoke yesterday saying that um, uh, the, the, the budget deficit will be 2% higher than originally thought. This is because they're losing, um, they're losing oil, although they're raking in oil and gas dividends. They're not at revenue, not as high as they were. And adding to that from Russia, Putin now saying that he will punish those who go along with the European um, cap of $60 a barrel, and he will punish them, although he will give special permission to other countries um, to have access to oil and gas. And this plainly refers to India and China, which are buying, buying it up, albeit at um, reduced prices and thus not giving um, Russia the sort of revenue that it actually wants. Spain. Now, Spain and the EU. Spain has joined in with the other, um, with other EU countries, including uh, Germany and France, to give um, help, direct state help for the cost of living crisis. It's giving 10 billion euro. Um, it, and it's also cuts to, um, uh, cuts to VAT and a one-off 200 euro payments to families earning less than 27,000 euros a year. Originally, um, help was given to families earning a lot less than that, but now that's been brought up very, very slightly. They have got inflation down in that country to 6.8%, which is the lowest um, in the EU. Um, Germany, if you remember, there's got a price break as far as gas and energy costs are concerned. France um, has, has decided on a 45 billion euro package, and of course, this is the UK cap um, on energy uh, bills, which brings the average to about two and a half thousand pounds a year. As far as the United Kingdom is concerned, um, blue chips, those are the so-called blue chips, those are FTSE 100 big stocks, actually. They've had a record 55 billion um, shares bought back. They've taken advantage of equity prices being historically low, um, and they have, uh, it's mainly oil and gas companies actually who've done it, um, they returned of the 55 billion, 22.1 billion back to shareholders. It's a way of rewarding shareholders for staying in there. And finally, in the UK, bosses surveyed by Lloyds Bank, the majority are not joining in with the Bank of England's um, gloomy forecast for 2023. Yes, there will be a recession, but according to Lloyds Bank and according to the survey, um, the majority of those bosses actually surveyed in 1,200 companies were relatively optimist, optimistic about 2023. And even though the EU itself, um, which of course doesn't, doesn't concern us directly anymore, even though it's a neighbour, doesn't concern the UK an enormous amount, is set to shrink quite fast according to the Financial Times, um, 30 economists surveyed by them. Um, Britain's boss Losses are relatively optimistic about 2023. That's not a bad note to go out on from the global view. All right, real quickly, I'd like to ask Michael, why is it that the, EU, the, the European Central Bank is still tightening? Isn't this tightening going to have a knock-on effect as regards the economy? Because they said the outlook is still to tighten for the better part of next year. Yeah, I think it will, uh, and, and it certainly will have an effect. But like every other central bank, what it's saying is inflation down first, try not to crush the economy, try for soft landing, and then encourage um, economies to work again. So, yes, I mean, th there is an immediate danger of, of possible um, recession and possible tightening too fast. But I don't think the European Central Bank could be accused of tightening too fast of anything. People have been saying it's been tightening too slowly. So I feel as though um, even though uh, the, the EU economy is set to shrink quite fast, according to the FT, I feel as though the central bank will be wanting to stamp down on inflation because it's now four times, at least four times, the average um, of, 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 what, of what its target of 2% inflation is. So there's no question that's what they're going to do in the future. Uh, we will see how the various economies react to that. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, talking about the UK bosses being optimistic um, about next year, despite the gloomy predictions, another area I'd like you to speak on is on tech. 
So according to reports, um, tech in the UK, particularly in London, did quite well um, in the last year despite the economic recession. And next year, they're supposed to even do better. So uh, the valuation is around one trillion naira. There's some big uh, back-ins this year, even though they didn't quite hit the target of over 41 billion as was projected. They still came to around 29.3 uh, billion pounds in terms of investment or back-ins for these tech companies. I'd like you to speak to this, please, because we've been talking about the gloom, you know, the, the businesses which haven't done quite well because of the recession, but tech in London has actually done reasonably well in the past year. It has, and I think a lot, of, a lot of those companies are taking advantage of um, cheaper prices, uh, where they, uh, cheaper prices where they can actually find them. But I feel also as well that you know most most people would say, and I think one of the reasons again, I, I don't know the insights of the of the Lloyd survey, um, but the, the headline figure I think probably relates to the fact that most people business is actually regarded downturn as a place to start investing, not running scared away from it. And, and the most important thing about this is that this, this was not a survey necessarily of the largest companies. These are SMEs, these are small and medium sized concerns. We're relatively optimistic about the way things are going at the moment. So with all the headwinds, all the headwinds of a recession and so on, they feel as though, I, I'm guessing now, but I, I feel as though there is a big build up in terms of consumption, um, which is actually not happening at the moment because people are, people are worried and when people are worried they tend not to spend but I suspect that will probably change next year but who's to say I mean it, it's very difficult to make predictions um, as we are in the, in the teeth of a recession right now. Well I mean um, yes uh, it's good to hear the uh, Russian finance minister saying that uh, the price cap uh, is likely to affect uh, uh, deficit Russian deficit uh, a bit further but isn't it too early uh, to connect that with growth uh, within the Russian economy, considering the fact that one, uh, the same Sulanov was saying uh, that they will reduce output by 5% to 7% in uh, 2023. Two, the shortfall will be funded through uh, domestic uh, 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 bonds. And three, in any case, there is still uh, great demand for Russian oil uh, from India, from China, uh, which has helped revenue uh, in that country. Would it not be too early uh, to uh, uh, say that, yes, the, Russia is beginning to really feel the pinch? Maybe this is temporary, and still are not just trying to be realistic. And then, of course, uh, COVID. Japan has introduced new measures against travelers from China. Now they have to uh, be subjected to tax. They have to show proof of negative tax. That's if you are coming from China. It doesn't apply to Hong Kong. It doesn't apply to travelers from Macau. Uh, India is considering the same measure. Malaysia has introduced the same measure. Uh, the US is also considering the same measure for travelers uh, from uh, China. Is this an indication that uh, you know the COVID resurgence in uh, China is really a matter of uh, serious concern, uh, considering the fact that China continues to, uh, you know, uh, reopen. I, I happen to think it is a matter of serious concern. I think 240 million cases of COVID and um, again, it's all anecdotal, um, and I stress this all the time talking about China, but it looks anecdotal as well. It looks like hospitals are filling up, particularly with the old people, um, and, and there is a competition for Western-based vaccines rather than using either home-produced ones or Russian-produced ones. So I feel as though um, I, I, think, I think there is a, a danger of it. Depends what you think about COVID. Uh, I mean, it, it's entirely possible that we all have something like it, but our immune systems have... Have, have actually beaten, uh, are continuing to beat it back in the same way that a cold or a flu rises as well. I'm not diminishing the, the aspects of COVID. I'm just saying that I think a zero COVID policy is, is a bit of a mistake. But again, I'm only going on what it's called, actually caused in China, which appears to be, appears to be A, uh, a lack of, um, F, of FDI, foreign direct investment, or a, a, a shortening of that. Certainly, um, people looking at that and wondering what the regulators are actually going to do in China. Um, and so that doubt is doubt is not a good place to, to place investment. And I, I, I'm sure I don't need to say this to to our viewers either. I mean, when you're looking at something like China, you, you consider you, you you know you look at the you look at the possibilities of the market there. But at the same time, you look at 
you look at the regulations and 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 the and the and the kind of confines and and the lockdowns which are being proposed, and you have to say to yourself, you know, what's actually going on? And in that kind of uncertainty, very very difficult indeed. As far as Russia is concerned, um, I was reading a very interesting piece about this. Now, as you quite rightly said, I'm in Cape Town at the moment, just temporarily, and um, in 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 conditions of extreme secrecy, a Russian ship actually docked just across the bay from where I am at the moment in a place called Simonstown, which is a naval port. And it was there during the night. It unloaded and loaded during the night. Now, South Africa has been not, was, was one of those countries, like a lot of countries in Africa, which is not unfriendly towards Russia. So I think, I think that, 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 that whilst it may be that the European Union, the United States and the UK and other countries are putting sanctions against Russia, they won't find the same in Africa. And, that, and quite rightly, Russia looks at Africa as being the developing continent over the next 20 years. So I think you're going to see it much, much the way the Chinese have. But what, the difference between the Chinese approach and the Russian approach to Africa is saying, look, we understand that you have these these these. Um, backgrounds of colonialism, which you quite rightly hate. We're not. We're not wanting to colonise you. We are just saying that we we want to regard you as allies. But you will develop in your own way. Now, if African countries actually buy that, there is a tremendous opportunity for Russia and its and its cheaper gas and oil revenues to actually take place. And there there are um, seven, as I understand it, seven um, tankers as we speak um, on the high seas with their um, identification systems actually switched off now, um, which, are, which are waiting for China and India. Who's to say that they won't be loading into Africa as well? So, I mean, that, that's the kind of world that, that, that Russia is looking at right now. It, for better or worse, it does not necessarily regard the EU, the UK and the US and other G7 nations as being primarily their export markets. There are plenty of other places in the world and Africa is one of them. Well, thank you very much, Michael Wilson. Thank you very much indeed. Now, for business updates across the African continent, Rotus Udiri joins us. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, uh, Rafai. Just Rotus. continuing the conversation from yesterday, you heard Michael Wilson talking about the welfare package that had been improved, uh, approved in Spain with regards to cost of living crisis. He mentioned Germany. He mentioned France. He mentioned the UK. He mentioned a number of countries that have taken action with respect to improving welfare. So we continue the conversation with the police. There is a poll on the This Day website, www.thisdaylive.com. And it continues the conversation. Your opinion matters. I encourage everybody watching to go on the website, scroll down on the This Day website, and you'll see this poll. There are calls for a creation of state police as a measure to tackle rising insecurity in Nigeria. Do you agree that state police will tackle Nigeria's security challenges? Yes, no, not sure. Go ahead and, and, and vote. But Beyond state police, excuse me, beyond insecurity, there's also the matter of the welfare of the police. Now, I heard, you know, you three in the conversation yesterday, Rafai saying that American police are paid well, but even though they are paid well, they're still shooting black people. Not sure if that's an accurate comparison because there's a racial dynamic there where if a black person, you're more often than not at that's a greater chance. That's an accurate comparison, but I'll, I'll tell you why. Yeah. Well, let's go through I'll it. I'll tell you why. Let's start this off. Yeah. Let's look at some of the approvals that were put forward by the Federal <coughs> Executive Council in December of 2021. 20% pay increase for the Nigerian police. 1 billion naira for uninsured uh, personnel. 13.1 billion for outstanding death benefits of about 5,472 of them. 18.6 billion for tax waivers for junior officers so they can take, back, take home more pay. 61 billion for increase in rent subsidies. The subsidies are now anywhere from 15 to 20%. These have not yet been approved. Let's just go back to that before we get to con salaries. These are yet to be approved. The Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, said that none of these, because this was supposed to take effect January of 2022, she said that it was not in the 2022 budget and that the, uh, they had to be in the appropriation bill and that this had to be, a, a supplementary budget had to be sent. If you remember last week, we broke the news here on Arise News that the appropriation bill for 2023 had to be, had not been submitted, it had to be reaffirmed. I think it's today that they're going to be putting that forward. So this hasn't been proved. In March of this year, the, the um, House of Reps summoned the Minister of Finance, summoned Ben Akabwezi of the Budget Office, summoned a number of representatives to ask them why none of this had gone through. This is yet to be approved. 
Also, um, the, there was now rumors later in March of a strike that many police personnel were going to go on strike because their pay had not been approved. The police force now put out a notice saying that this is a rumor being put forward by mischievous people. But they also threw this in. They said, well, a strike is mutinous. Essentially, I guess, suggesting that sending a message that if there was indeed a strike, it is mutiny against the police force. But let's get to pay. Take a look at, um, let's take a look at the constable pay. You're after, you've got the police recruits, right, who are the entry level that are in training. Then you become, you become a constable, which is essentially uh, entry level. I got this online. I've been looking for trying to get verified for you guys. But this is roughly for grade 3, 43,293. Your 20% increase, if it is approved, takes him to 51,940. For grade 10, 51,113, his 20% increase or her 20% increase takes them to 61,000. Is this enough with where inflation is? Is this enough with where currency depreciation is? Is that enough at 20%? We continue. Let's take a look at, I think our next graph is the top 10 highest police killings across the world. The Philippines is number one. Mr. Duarte is 6,000 6, plus, the average between 2016 to 2021. Brazil is in second place, 5,000 as of 2019. Then you've got Venezuela, you've got India, you've got Syria, you've got El Salvador, you've got the United States, which is the only developed country in the top 10 for highest amount of killings, which tells you what you need to know about gun culture in America. Then you've got Nigeria, about 841 as of 2018, Afghanistan and Pakistan. I unfortunately didn't have enough time. What I intended to do was to compare the average pay of the top 10 nations with the highest killings to Nigeria. But I was only able to get like a couple of them. Venezuela, their currency is in the toilet, so I just left that one out. But Philippines average, according to Salary Explorer, is $540 uh, uh, monthly. Brazil, $438. Pakistan, $99. Nigeria for the grade three at 43,000 using the official exchange rate is $94 a month. At the parallel market rate is 56. I ask you, I ask you. Can I, can I make Hold on, I want to, let me, let me wrap up before you make your point. Yeah. You, the, the, the Nigerian police force is at the entry level for a constable, is the low, one of the lowest in the world, if not the lowest, compared to other nations that have higher average killings Per, on an annual basis compared to Nigeria. And there was a lot of bashing of the police that took place yesterday. And I really just want to state this, that on average, Nigerian police are good officers. I, I'm sure some of us know some of them personally. I know some of them personally. They are good. They are bad apples that are in the police force, but we cannot paint the entirety of the police force with a bad brush saying that they are bad. Now, to, that does not justify what happened with that, the lady that was killed, and the justice still needs to be served. And it is, it is incredibly peak political season where you've got a statement from President Buhari, you've got a statement from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Atiku Abubakar, you've got a statement from, um, from Peter Obi, you've got a statement from everybody who now of a sudden really cares a lot about this. Reform has to happen, and just to emphasize, that 20% pay it is, not, is not enough. You must increase the welfare of these police officers because they are putting their lives on the line on a daily basis to keep us safe. When something happens, we are the first, they're the first people that we call. So that pay has to be improved, and until you improve that pay, I doubt, as far as morale is concerned, you're going to see much happening. So we cannot exclude, this is the point I want to make, you cannot exclude the low pay of police officers from what is going on in Nigeria. Okay, so Rotus, you, uh, have, a, you have a way of missing arguments. Go ahead, point go, go ahead, you. okay. What I said yesterday is this, and please listen properly. When you say police kill people, it is not because of money. It is because of an interpretation of bias that has not been checked over a period of time. The fact that there are no consequences for actions. And that's why you see in the case that an average police officer in America stops a black man, a killing will result in it. An average police officer stops a white man, a killing might not result from it. Oh, hi, officer. Sorry, I didn't see that way, officer. Might probably end it. If you remember the case in America, the bias was so much that a police officer even harassed a Harvard professor. 
You remember that case that he could have even derailed America and Obama settled it by calling the two men to drink. That's the same bias at which the police, I'm not exonerating the fact that the pay is not poor. The pay is poor. But when you have a society that the bias shows that there's no repercussion for action, people will constantly repeat those actions. In Nigeria, the bias is the fact that the police officer feels because of the legal system, because of the fact that there's institutional ineffectiveness, he can kill people and go score free with it because investigations will not be holistic. And police officers have muted this for the opt-in time. And it is based on this they can do and undo. How you remember your own case that you stated in yeah. this same Ajiwe police station? Same one. You went to bail somebody. Is it non-payment of no salary crime, for no crime? Just Is it non-payment of salary that made the policeman carry gun? Ta 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 ta. Is it non-payment of salary that make policeman carry gun in a party? And you say, Olokpa, take one thousand for your bullet. He will shoot in the air. That is indiscipline. You saw a tweet that went viral that somebody pointed the police officer drinking on duty, and the police spokesperson that reacted and said he's not supposed to drink on duty. And I was like, shame on the police spokesperson. Is it not? Is that what he's supposed to say? What stop you for instituting action immediately against him? You also make my point for me, Rotus. Look at Philippines, five hundred and forty dollars. But why the police can't do and undo is because they have a state that backs them for this extrajudicial killing. Duterte said, "Go all out, kill both the innocent and non-innocent because I want to have a clampdown on drugs." I'm not exonerating the fact that they're not paying. Well. In fact, I will go out there and canvass for the payments. But what we should also do. Make consequences available for actions. Let us have a legal system where people can be investigated and justice meted. If the police understands that, that there are consequences for every action, and they see the actions being meted out on one or two of their erring officers, there's going to be a certain level of fear. The problem is the police don't respect the citizens. And this has also been aided and abated by the political class. That's my problem. Okay. How many so, police so officers so. have you seen that has the audacity to kill a soldier in traffic? If that woman was wearing a soldier khaki, and, daddy, uh, would they shoot her? My view is as follows. Uh, uh, I thought we had settled to this discussion yesterday mm. when we made it very clear that, look, it's not because of Good poor morning. pay. Okay. That policemen are it? trigger What's happy. But you have to bring up the argument today. I disagree. <laughs> this is not an argument. This is I not know, a debating. I know, but I this know, is not right. a debating all. True. Oh, yeah, where true. Anchors insist on winning an argument. <laughs> no, it's, just actually, it's just a conversation. It's just for us to put information yep, out there. Yep. So let's you know moderate the passion <laughs> with which we want to win an argument. Understood. Okay, now the point is this. Is it because of poor pay that uh, Policemen drink on duty. God bless you. Dr. Is it Nancy. because of poor pay that uh, policemen uh, take cannabis <laughs> while on duty? Because there was also a story <laughs> like that. It's simply a question of discipline. Now, nobody argues with the fact that you should pay everybody well. I'm sure if you were to do the comparison of the pay of journalists in Nigeria and US oh, and UK, God, you will more or less come to the same conclusions. Hmm. Okay, so people should not use poor pay as justification for lack of professionalism. And you see that the police hierarchy, they've been talking about violation of standard produce procedure, of rules of engagement. I think that that is where the issue is. Hmm. And we should not use pay, you know, uh, to argue for criminality. However, you have a point that, okay, the pay can be increased. Nobody can argue with that. Hmm. Everybody can do with more money. I'm sure if uh, they tell nurses they will increase their money too, they will agree. Mm. After all, in the UK, all the workouts that you have is because of pay, okay. is because of cost of living. And sooner can uh, Jeremy Hunt are saying we cannot afford it because we will have to borrow more money. Now, you also pointed out that last year, 
the federal government agreed to improve, to increase money. That, uh, you know, uh, promise, increased by 20%, was approved. And you are now saying that it's not in the budget. But I recall, it doesn't implement it. Yeah. well, I recall that in September, mm. the police affairs minister, Dagin Yadi, said that they had begun implementation. In yes. September of this year. In September of this yes. year. You can double check it. Double check he it. said that they have begun uh, implementation. But the policemen were complaining about their allowances, that there was a cut in their allowances. We can double check that to confirm it. Another issue that the police have, have raised this year has to do with pension. And only six days ago, the federal government approved billions for the 318,000 policemen and officers that we have. You know, group life assurance, they call it. And leadway assurance was selected as the lead on the right. Mm. And the whole argument is to improve the welfare of policemen. But the point you can make is that they need to do more. Even if they started implementing, you know, you cannot, when you look at the amount that they are being offered, and you look at the uh, inflation rate of 21.47%, uh, yeah. then, of course, it's not enough. But the same argument can be made for every worker in Nigeria. So why are nurses not killing people? Why are doctors not killing they people? They don't have guns. Because, well, they have, they have, <laughs> they they have a the syringe. Bus. They have the syringe. They have the and then you yeah. come and argue that it's because nurses are not well paid. Okay. It's well, because doctors are not well paid. Well, right. so, I rest my case. That. I was just going to mention that you talked about a 20% increase of their salary, but it's not consistent with the real, reality of inflation. Therefore, they're still being shortchanged even if the new pay even if the new pay comes into play, effect, yeah, into effect, yeah, yeah. 20% as opposed to the 21% inflation, which people have said, you know, analysts have said is perhaps even underreported, is a shame. It's, it's nothing to write home about. That's the truth. Mm. I'm glad you've analyzed this, and I'm glad that Dr. Rufai have also talked about talking about the general welfare of Nigerian workers. Put that side by side by the take home of our politicians, mm. not just in their um, basic salary, because they can come out and say that I've only earned this amount, yeah, but allowances. in their allowances yeah. and packages. Yeah. There is, a, it's disproportionate, and that would definitely not all go well with the workers. Mm. We need to treat our workers better, you yeah. know, particularly government workers in Nigeria. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you thank Rogers. You. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll be talking to Dr. Sam Amadi. A rights news analyst and Professor Anthony Killer, a professor of strategy and development and director of Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies. They're with us. We'll be right back. to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. take your business to its zenith. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. I'm about to serve better breakfast. If you're in Lagos, you need to see this. I'm not just streaming content, I'm just escaping traffic. Get more data to enjoy exclusive content. Dial star 141 hash now. Airtel, the smartphone network. 
My brother, my sister, do you know that winning an election is not only about getting the majority vote? For that, your candidate to be declared winner of the election, he or she must secure 25% of the vote in two-thirds of all states plus the FCT to be president and 25% of the vote in two-thirds of all local governments of a state to be governor. This is constitutional and every presidential candidate has had to pass this threshold. Even governors have had to make this mark to get elected in their states. We live in one country with different languages, religions, and ethnic groups. This is why it is not enough to have only northern votes or southern votes or eastern votes or western votes. The only way to get elected as president or governor is by gaining enough support across the country and states. Let us make sure that we know now so that we don't cause an issue tomorrow. This message is brought to you by the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. Set to take the African continent and the world by storm. They are giants in every sense of the word, and they will bring entertainment that's just as big. Don't miss the first ever season of Big Brother Titans with two African giants, Naita and Nsamsi, on the biggest roof together. Big Brother Titans starts on Sunday, 15th of January, on DSTV 198, Go TV 29, and Africa Magic. Headline sponsor, Bamboo, Flutterwave, and Lotus Star. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. According to yesterday's copy of these day newspapers, there is an increasing likelihood that the first ballot at the February 25 presidential election may not produce a clear winner. By implication, there may be a runoff in the presidential contest before a clear winner is returned by the Independent National Electoral Commission. Although, with the current standing, the presidential candidate of People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, can still boast 23 states where he's likely to get 25%, while his all progressive Congress rival, Bola Tinumbu, is confident of 20 states where he can also pull his weight. The candidates of Labour Party, Peter B, and New Nigeria People's Party, Rabi Kwankwanso, follow as third and fourth in that order, will fall far short in many states to satisfy, satisfy the constitutional requirement of 25% of votes cast in 24 states. This latest development follows a recent Disney poll, The Explainer, released by the Disney 2023 Election Center Projections, where a breakdown of new realities is advanced with implications for each candidate. Joining us on The Morning Show to break down the projections by Disney is Dr. Sam Amadi, Arise News Analyst, and Professor Anthony Killer, Director a Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies and author of the book, Episodes of Anthony Killer, Reflections on Nigeria. Welcome to The Morning Show. Professor Killer and Dr. Sam Amadi. Good to see you. Thank Good morning. You. Good to be here. Okay. Gentlemen, let's start with the basics to try to lay the foundation for the discussion. Now, the, um, this is the political season, and increasingly we are having groups coming up with polls, newspapers coming up with projections, 
In fact, even uh, prophets, uh, radio prophesy, I saw one uh, analysis, projections by Primate uh, Ayo, uh, Ayo, eh? Primate Ayo Dili of the Henry Evangelica. Of what value are these polls, projections, assumptions, and of what effect could they possibly have on the outcome of the election with regard to accuracy? Let's look at that uh, basic uh, uh, concept first before we now go to the these day projections. Let me start with you, Professor Killer, and then we'll take Dr. Amadi's uh, views also. Well, I think polls generally are good tools to gauge the, um, to gauge the polls of the nation. It's a pity that we tend to do it in Nigeria just for election. Generally, you know, in any society that is data-led, polls are things you do continuously to test popularity of people, government policies, programs, and ideas, and, um, and, and even effect consequences of policies on the nation. So polls are always welcomed. I think the effect of the poll is um, overrated for what people think, because um, most voters tend to have made up their mind way before now. Um, there's, there's a bracket of just about 25% of voters who tend to make, their, make up their mind in a very rational way towards the, the, the election. They, they tend, those voters are swayed, perhaps because of what we call a big event, something unexpected that comes up. It could be positive or it could be negative. You know. P those people who believe in truth and integrity will change their mind if it comes out that the candidate or party they're supporting is a blatant liar. Uh, you know, people who believe in competence will perhaps change their, change their mind if they discover that the, the candidate they were voting against turns out to be very competent, perhaps in a debate, in a town hall meeting, or, or in an investigation. Uh, but generally, people have made up their mind. So there, there's a bracket. It, within that 25% of bracket, the experience you know, there's a very small percentage, about 5 to 8% of people, who really sit down to look at all the conditions and then make up their mind. Some optimists, some of my colleagues who are optimists, will call it up to 10%. Who would say, I'm going to vote left or right because if I vote one way, that might be a waste of vote. So let me tactically go to one side. But, you know, interestingly, human beings are not as rational as we make them from economics to politics. It tends to be more sort of a gut, emotional, and, and head following. But to your question, I think polls are important and they should be encouraged and, you know, rather than discard them. And I think politicians do a natural thing, which is common of them, to discard polls that do not favor them. I think we should just ignore such feeling and insist on the accuracy of the polls. And, and, and I want our viewers to ask themselves a question. Regardless of who they support, when they see polls, based on their own perception, do they think it's true or false? That's the first test. The second test is to take a closer look at the polls to test for their accuracy. So, for example, when you do polls in Nigeria, like everywhere in the world, you ask yourself that these polls, the people they asked, are they voters or people who are just going to stay at home and express their minds? Then you, you want to test the sort of the, the method used for the polls. Are we testing the people in rural areas who are not online on social media? Or are we basing it on just people who reach on the telephone and on social media? Those are the factors that I think are more fascinating about the polls. And, and our viewers should know one thing as well. Contrary to what politicians say publicly, they have internal polls as well. You know, they gauge situations to see where they're strong. So this is a case of what happened before the reform in the church, where the Bible, i.e. the poll in this case, was accessible only to the priest in this case, to politician. And now, in modern times, the poll has been open to everybody as well to, to look at. Well, Dr. Amadi, the value of uh, polls and projections and assumptions about general election with specific reference okay. to Nigeria. OK, let's start. I, I, I agree with um, uh, Prof, my friend Killer, that uh, polls are very important. Um, especially for politicians who use polls to gauge how they are doing, especially run down to end of campaign, you'll be doing more of figures, numbers, uh, look at demographs. Uh, if the polls are sometimes disaggregated, like in the US, you can do polls of 
uh, favorability rating, preference, issues that candidates, uh, electorates uh, care about. So that will help campaigns, you know, design messaging to deal with those kind of uh, issues that the polls trigger. For example, some polls can look at, uh, tells you that, look, you are dealing with favorability problem, even though you have, you are good on issues. So, for example, a ruling party that is sitting over uh, bad economy, their own fault or not their fault, it doesn't count, would know that they're going to have problem in terms of if voters are going to reflect more on the economic side of things, then they're going to be more in trouble. If voters are more concerned, for example, with identity issues, whether it is religion, ethnicity, or inclusion, then they know how to craft their intervention. If voters are more worried about insecurity, so the question will now be, do, what kind of profile do we need to put across of our candidate to show that he can do the job better? Or what kind of antecedent history are we going to talk about? Or what kind of framing of our message? So, very important. And like he said, the parties are doing their polls. Uh, they're, they're not making it public because sometimes the numbers are not very encouraging for them. But again, behind the, beyond that is the idea that, look, uh, we've seen the masters of this trade, people like Natsiva, you know, uh, often get it wrong. Uh, and get it wrong might be because of several factors. One of them is presumptions. You know, um, Professor Ted Tetlock did a book, great book classic called um, 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 political judgment. And the idea is that oftentimes we make mistakes because we consider too much rationality. You know, they look at voters as rational persons, especially in more developed economies where uh, there are less cultural constraint to choice and decision making. So we project and then probably we miss out that voters, like every other person, it has embedded rationality and that perception, optics that can change in two, three days and hours, if you like, can trigger a disproportionate impact in terms of voter response. But again, also, oftentimes, we miss out these numbers because also voters are more, not, uh, probably less communicative. They, they hide their preferences or they mistake their preferences or basically say they won't explain. And that's why the uncertainty keep rising. So that's when you talk about uh, empirical polls. Dick Morris, who was uh, Obama's uh, poster, he clear his book, Oval Office. He says, look, each time, whether it's 1,000 uh, sample size or 3,000 or 4,000, we have the same number of accuracy. He says, look, once I take out phone numbers from a, a public phone book, and I, 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 it's methodical, it's systematic and consistent, a 1,000 sample is as credible as a 10,000 sample. And that's why if you look at Anal poll, Anal poll NOI, which has been very consistent and with some level of credibility. The sample size, the 1,000, the 3,000, and their, their chief said, look, it remained the same. So the sample size might not be very important in the science of polling, but what matters is how you define the samples, uh, the demographs and how you're representative of maybe ethnicity, gender, and other socioeconomic profiling that's captured in that, in that uh, um, um, sample size. So in Nigeria, would polls tell us a lot about voter behavior on the day of voting? They would do. And I looked at the previous uh, uh, NOI polls on 2015, 2011, 2019. They got it right. They, they, they didn't get to a two horse two race. So they didn't get to a oh, number of votes A will win over B. And it's simpler. But with a four horse race, if you like, or a three horse race, depending on how you look at it, then the nuances not matter. And that's why the this day uh, projection, uh, and they didn't say it's based on telephone or anything, but again, based on analytics, based on conceptual ideas around party dynamics, around social, mob, uh, social, social uh, infrastructure, who can mobilize people, we are, how, how are the governors moving, how are the major political actors shaping up. And so they made educated, you know, reasonable. And I think uh, the, 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 the explainers make sense. But then you're going to look at the numbers. So if somebody has 25, 20%, and you have 15, 20% undecided, even if all the analytics are correct and hold, it means that in two, three days, you could see the whole electoral map change radically in terms of who gets 25%. And then you're going to go into a runoff. And then we've not even seen also the numbers in terms of actual majority. Our voting, our constitutional framework for winning is such that if everybody didn't get 20, 20 uh, to, uh, to third of the required spread, then majority votes 
step in. So the guy who had 23, the guy who had 20, and the guy who had 18, uh, the guy who had 18, if he scores the highest number of votes, depending on where the votes are, and depending on the gap in which he's winning his, his area or the area where, he's, uh, where he has the spread, might be the one who enters into the last uh, straw vote. So primarily, we should trust polls when the methodology are set out clear, because they tell us over time they have a level of consistency with margin of error. But beyond all that, we should also understand that is based on certain conceptual construct about how people behave that in our own culture may not pan out that way. And of course, several dynamics might be overlooked or may be exaggerated or under-explained, in which case uh, you, we've seen that happen with uh, Trump victory in 2016 when that all the big guys who made a call got it wrong. And they said, look, we got it wrong because of this, this, this. We didn't see the black swan in the room and it came and you know, disarrayed all our permutation and analytics. So it, it, that's the way it works. But we should take polls, especially when they are empirical polls, very seriously, because some polls that doesn't matter, they all most usually get it right. All right, thank you, Dr. Sam Amadi. As expected, the these day projections has, have, has elicited various reactions from the political parties in view. Indeed, the Labour Party have come out to say that they, they, they don't believe that they are non-existent, as this projection states, in some northwest and northeast states. Whilst the uh, PDP, under with Atiko Bubaka being their frontliner, has said that they're going to win it with the first ballot and they're not even going to go to a runoff. I'm just looking at some of the results or the outcomes of these projections. I'd like to you know, hear your take on the responses from these parties. They've also talked about the fact that perhaps uh, giving Ashwajibola Ahmed Tinubu some figures in the southeast and southwest, it, it, well, southeast in particular, sorry, southeast and south-south, is quite generous. And just to understand, really, in terms of, yes, we see that in the southeast, uh, Tinubu has 10%, in Enugu 10, 15, 15, 10. They're saying they don't, they're not quite as optimistic as this projection state. I'd like to um, hear from you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Sam Amadian, of course, Professor Kila, on their responses to the projections. Well, for me, I think the parties have responded as we should expect. Uh, the, the, the PDP candidate and his campaign team will look at uh, the this day projection and say, look, 23, 23 states, we just need two more. And look, you guys discounted us so much in the southeast, I, we think we can be more competitive. We actually think that uh, maybe we could actually, those states where we have 20, 10, 15, we're going to do more. And they are legitimate to think that way because, look, like it's a projection, several factors. For example, if somebody says uh, the factor of incumbency in, let's say, Imo State, APC, would give uh, PDP, uh, APC, 10%, uh, uh, and uh, the factor of OB movement in southeast would probably give uh, Labor 60 a PDP campaign team can say, look, look closer. I you see we have these stalwarts, we have this spread, we have three, uh, two senators out of three, or one out of three. We have uh, House of Reps members, X number, House of Assembly members. Look, this is about politics. This is about getting the votes out. We will get it done there. And therefore, we think that we're going to do 25 in Imo, this is just an example, or we think that we can we'll do 25 in Cross River uh, in spite of uh, weekends or in spite of APCs, Go Governor, and in spite of obese movement. Those are legitimate issues they raise. And so if they get that calculation, they will say, we're going to win on the first, uh, uh, on the first count. And of course, everybody is discounting who wins the majority vote. The assumption is that only one person would win to, to third, and that one person will probably have the simple majority. Okay. Now, Labour can argue very well. So look, you have basically 20% in Kaduna. That's not correct. Of course, there's over 15 or 20% uh, undecided there. We can tell you we can get 30, we can get 40, we can get 25. So they can actually reckon them so that there are three or four states where they can say that we are sure of 25. They can argue that a state like uh, Adamawa where they're giving 10. Some of them, uh, Labour people have said, oh, Adamawa, the Christians, uh, I, I, they, they, they will have a chunk of vote to take from Atiku's place. We can get 25. Those are reasonable projects. So not a bad idea to dispute those figures and the analytics that DJ use and the, and, the, and the scoring. But what would be wrong, I think, is to say this is fraudulent, this is scam, this doesn't make sense, it makes sense in the uh, logic of analytics 
and projections. But you can it's a projection, so you can have a counter projection based on analytics. So what I would do if I'm looking at this is say, look, this is wrong in these states, we're gonna win. I give another example, Taraba. Maybe uh, they're gonna go 25%. Maybe they get more than that. Maybe they, they can actually fend off one of the contenders and they won't get 25. Lagos, a level can argue clearly. Say, look, this Lagos, we are going to get more than you gave us. So we're gonna have this put around this. Uh, projections, but I heard P2B somewhere, I think, on television, make the point, a present point, that this is not, uh, he says it's a projection. This they did not say that they interview people. So we take it as projection. They are largely right in the, in the factors they are considering. So that's a responsible response to say, look, yes, this is what it is. This is their projection and perception. But for us, these are the numbers we're working on, and we have done our own pools, or we're relying on these other three pools that gave us you know, the lead, and we're going to now go and fix these six areas and show that we are stronger than these editors or our explainers have captured. All these responses are good. What is not responsible is to throw it away and don't look at underneath the narrative that tells you how you should rejig and re-strategize your campaign to you know, move away or counteract or mine those um, uh, factors that this uh, uh, explanation says are have an implication for the race in these states for each of the parties. So reasonable response from PDP, reasonable response from um, uh, uh, Labour, but what matters is now how you analyze this and take it to redesign your strategy and your tactical engagement you know, on ground. Strategy for political parties. Professor Killa, your take on the responses thus far from the political parties. Well, I think my take on the response of political parties is this. The viewers should be warned, and we should always remember that when politicians speak in public, they rarely speak to inform or to analyze or to deliberate in public. They tend to speak to persuade at all times. and. What they like is what favors their intention to win. What they don't like is anything that is against their desire to win, regardless of whether it is true, objective, um, good or bad. It, you know, politicians are very self-centered and they're just focused on winning. So that is all what they want to hear. We must say very clearly here that, yes, polls get it wrong sometimes. But please let me assure all our viewers that most times, say for the case of outright fraud, most times in history of humanity, polls get it right. Mm -hmm. And it is important to say this because it's the celebration of science, the celebration of knowledge that you can predict what millions of people are going to do by sampling just a few thousands of them. It's something that we should cherish and enjoy. It's something that is great. We should not let politicians, because of their own desire, their momentary desire, destroy science. The, the reason why we have this kind of conversation here is because partisan politics in Nigeria has no sense of institution. It has no respect of what is sacred and it has no regard for facts. Everybody is a cheap, um, a cheap sophist when it comes to partisan politics in this country and people just, you know, anything goes. People talk as if there's no history, as if there's no logic. What matters is winning. So here's my take. I think um, and by the way, it is important for people to note this, that when politicians react, rarely do you get a politician to say, I think you've given us more votes, too much votes in that state or in that region. They always complain to say you didn't give them enough. They don't come back to say, oh, no, I don't think we can get 80% in Adamawa or something. They will take that quietly. Then they'll complain about where they don't get enough votes. So I think viewers and citizens in general need to analyze things themselves. For the places where it appears um, the Labour Party's candidate, Peter Obi, is getting nil, I want viewers to understand that it doesn't mean it's getting zero votes. It simply means that the number of votes there are not high enough to be represented in clear percentages. And it is important to also note that in those places, the undecided votes should be looked at. There's a part in which politicians don't talk about in polls, and it is the quantity of undecided polls. Or, undecided voters, because that matters a lot. It matters because in some regions, people are not saying it because genuinely they've not made up their mind. In other places, they're not saying it because they don't want people to know who they're going to vote for. Those are the two cases. I, I argue that it is rare 
to find somebody living in Nigeria now that has no idea of who they're going to vote for. The re only reason why people can be undecided is perhaps the people they normally tend to vote for are not convincing enough for them. So maybe you're a natural APC voter, but you're not happy with the APC's performing. Then you tend to be undecided. Maybe you're a natural PDP voter, but you're not happy with the candidate. Then you might be undecided. Maybe you're looking at this new phenomenon of capital B, but you're not sure yet. You're gauging to see if this is a fluke, if it's just noise, or if it's just substance. Those are the reasons why people are undecided. So I think somehow we need to arrogate ourselves some kind of arrogance and ignore politicians and speak to people who are objective, who are general stakeholders when it comes to polls, not partisan stakeholders like politicians. Okay, I, I'll start with you, Professor Kila, then I'll go to uh, uh, Pro, uh, Dr. Sabamadi. Let's talk about this silent majority, as they were called in the time of Trump. These people, a lot of people don't talk about. The undecided people, the people that this projection say they're about 40%, which makes a large bulk. Can we go into the degree of rationality of, or irrationality? Are we going to have phenomenons like the Reagan Democrats, a bunch of Democrats that voted for Reagan, which was a Republican? Are we going to have those phenomenons and those variations in the silent majority? Professor Pikila, I'll come to you first. And Dr. Samadhi, I'll come to you. And happy Christmas and a prosperous New Year to both of you once again. Those are my wishes from my heart to both of you. Professor Kila, so you first. Thank you very much. You, you have a good heart. Yes, thank you very much. So here's the thing. Thank you very much for bringing the, um, the, the, the Reagan Democrats. And, and it will be said that, you know, a couple of decades later, Barack Obama talked about Obama can't at some point where he thought it was necessary to go and pull out um, Republicans that would vote for him. And it did work, you know, mind you. Some Republicans voted for, uh, for Obama, especially the, their children, you know, who sort of forced them to do it. We are in a situation now that is very new in the history of our politics, I, a situation of uncertainty and a situation where we truly have possible three-way vote. That is the reality. The nearest we got to this before in the history of Nigeria and, and I mean since we've been voting from the First Republic to now, since the 50s up to today, was what happened around 1979 and 1983, where we had the NPN as a major party, the UPN, and followed somewhat by the um, NPP. Um, you know, those who have read history of old enough will, will remember this party, Nigerian People's Party, Unity Party of Nigeria, and the National Party of Nigeria. Since 1999, we've been used to actually not just wondering who is going to win. It was clear. Because let's face it, up till 2015, the only national party in the country was actually the PDP. The other parties were mostly regional, you know, the other way. Be it ABGA, be it AD, be it ACN. They didn't really have a big national spread like the PDP had. So their, their path to power was pretty clear. It was in 2015, that we, for the first time, we had two national parties with equal spread contending issues. So it was easy to decide and it was easy to foresee where we're going to. Fast forward to 2023, when 2022, moving towards the 2023 now. We have two major issues at stake. Number one is the fact that for the first time in the history of Nigeria, we've actually tried two different sides. We ejected the ruling party, brought in an opposition party. Now, I am sure, and you know, those who know my history will know that I was one of those who actively campaigned for the APC, at least in 2015. Now, I'm sure that the most loyal voter citizen of the APC, in their conscience, not in public, in their heart of heart, will know the APC has not done the one that I was promised when they were formed and they came to power. 
you know, there might be lots of reasons. Um, the virus, um, bad luck, anything, anything, um, for various reasons. But the fact is, let us leave the why. Let's go to the what. The fact is, is that the imagined wonder that people were waiting for, the big transformation that people were waiting for, has not happened. You can judge it by the cost of food, by the availability of jobs, by the tendency of people to leave the country rather than come back. That magic has not happened. So it's a big burden on people who are inclined for the APC who are against the PDP. The PDP, some people miss them, but people have seen exactly that. Neither the PDP is this grand Eldorado we're talking about. You, and there's this Labour Party coming up, which people are not sure of. I think the Labour Party goes beyond, and, you know, and it is important here to distinguish between OB, obedience and obicracy. Obicracy is the management of obedience. Obedience is the passion of people following obedience, and obedience is the candidate himself. And I think the obicracy itself has failed in some areas. The ability to really manage this big passion from movement to party. You know, it's, there's, some, there's some glaring flaws there. All these things put together, disappointment in the ruling party, the, if you want, the lukewarmness towards the main opposition party and the uncertainty of the new thing on the horizon creates a big bulk of voters who you are referring to as the silent one, the undecided one. These are people who are looking at it. And if you go and look at those people, they tend to be older than 35 years old from the demographic I have seen. These are people who have seen a bit, not seen it all, they think they've seen it all, but they haven't seen it all. They've seen a bit of everything, and they're not really feeling this fire that will make them jump up and down for one side. They're looking at it gradually and saying, look, this thing doesn't look well. They're looking at the process of primaries on all the sides. They're looking at declaration of candidates, and they're saying, is this a brighter future indeed? Those are the people looking at the fundamentals. Those are the people looking at the economy, looking at the debt in which we are, and thinking, these people do not seem serious. They do not seem to be coming up with you know, mind-blowing big policies to say, we're going to, this is what we're going to do about it. Up till now, you know, this is good seasons, we wish well. Up till now, we've not had debate about who's going to privatize, who's going to leave it to the state. We're not having debate about who's going to cut taxes, who's going to increase it. And people who are leading the real life, you know, people who are earning salary, paying tax, living from what they earn, not magic, not gift, not miracles, not connection, people who are really waking up every morning to do their jobs, those people understand the dynamics. Whether you're selling food by the roadside or you're building something in a factory, if all you live by is what you earn, you'll understand the dynamics of governance and political economy more than any doctor in a classroom. Those people are looking at it and they're not persuaded. They're not reassured. There is no Messiah on the horizon for thinking people. People realize that we need to get little things right. And that, to your question, is the origin of that bulk of undecided voters. Because they're not persuaded that these people have come out, that most of the candidates have come out of pure merit. It's a lot of arrangement, compromise, threats, and you know, just magical things coming out. The, the silent voters are not looking for a leader or messiah. They're looking for a CEO. And when they look on the horizon, they are wondering, can this person be CEO? Especially because the CEO Nigeria is going to elect is not just a CEO. We're electing a CEO and chairman of board of directors if Nigeria were a corporate organization. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of responsibility. So they're not easily excited to, to answer your question. And, and, and because we have technology at hand, never in the history of humanity has information been so available. Because it is easy to turn on your TV, switch on your computer, actually your telephone, not even your computer, and see what's going on in the rest of the world and see the kind of debate people are having. We are talking here in this country at the moment about some people who live in the same country, traveling together to another country to go and make a decision about the country they live and they left. The, in the hours in which we're talking about that, you switch to another news channel or you read another page and you're seeing an Austrian astronaut that is jumping from space 
And you, and you just realize that there's little to be excited about here. So it is easy to be part of those Vogue voters. And, and I do think, and, and this goes beyond partisan politics, it is leadership. Leadership that goes beyond politics that extends from media to classrooms to community to churches and mosques. We need to go and interrogate those silent voters and engage them and make them loud. History tells us one thing. Those people you call silent um, majority, wait, they are silent majority, not just because you call them so. Anytime there's a radical change in the system, it is when the, the voice of the silent majority is heard. And I think we need to take it serious. And 40% is a lot. It's okay. a lot in a country where most voters vote. So, okay, Dr. Samabadi, I'd like you to come in here. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, maybe I, I disagree a little bit with uh, Prof to say that I don't think really that undecided, what well, undecided is 40%. Is okay, now who are undecided voters? Oftentimes we conflict two things. We conflict voters who don't want to exp uh, express their preference and voters who probably have not decided. Now, undecided voters are typically voters who are rational enough and they are trying to process based on you know, indicators, economy policy, uh, candidates, uh, issues on the, on the table. So they say, well, uh, this guy looks good to me, but look, he has got this issue. I'm weighing how this issue uh, uh, damages his candidature. I'm also likening candidate B, but it seems to me that um, I don't like his party, or I'm struggling to understand why he's focusing on this policy. Now, this kind of rational thinking that go into, it doesn't have to be professors, but basically voters who have been emancipated largely from being embedded in social network, whether in terms of uh, ethnic bias, religious bias, or group think. I mean, look at uh, Trump once said that among his supporters, even if he killed somebody on the Fourth Avenue or the Fifth Avenue in New York, that it won't have any impact. On, on, the, on, on the polls in terms of his supporters. They are supporting him because they have identified a closed system. They are fighting against what they think is the evil effect of globalization. Uh, they want to recreate their country in their own image, and this is a champion. So those voters are you know, trapped. So in my own uh, schema, I have three kinds of voters. I have the captive voters, most of our uh, mothers in the rural area, persons who are patron client relationship define their voting behavior. They simply know that ah, uh, Chief Amadi says we should vote for A. Chief Amadi moves to Party B. They follow Chief Amadi to Party B because Chief Amadi has been servicing that clientelist network for four years, and that is the time for them to pay back. Those are uh, entrapped voters. Those are those are the party. Uh, big shots, bank on. We have our voters. We, are, we have our structure in the villages and rural areas. There's also the emancipated voter, the, the, the young middle class professionals, graduates, angry, worried about their future. They are not embedded. They probably go home on Christmas or special days to see their parents. They make calls on phone. So they are not subject to that clientelistic you know, relationship. They are not bound to the principal who brings them out. And those are the ones who say, you know what, we want to make a change. Now, in that voter category, many of them are already made up their mind that are going to vote for whatever they think captures their rage for the moment. And that's where the obedient movement started its foundation with the NSAS people to made up of, look at the demographics, usually completely trained guys, guys who work in IT, guys who are self-employed, professionals, who have the capacity to sit back and access the causes of the crisis they are facing. Their mothers at home face this crisis. They know that they used to buy rice, for, uh, maybe a, a bag of rice for 13,000, 30,000. They're buying 40. They used to know that they buy granite, a bottle of granite for 300 naira, now it's 1,200 naira. They know those things, but they're not able to relate this siege, economic siege they are suffering, to clear policies and clear political issues around party individuals and character. But these are children who are now emancipated, have that capability. So they make up their mind. There are still a few, like uh, Prof said, who are still decided, who are trying to decide where to go to. But I think that the uncertain voters in this country are probably more or less than what we are projecting. What we are doing is that some of these persons are not visible to us in terms of the analytics we are using. Look at these projections. So you look at things like party structure, ability to mobilize. These people are not visible. 
Again, let's come to that issue, the Tom Bradley effect. We had in 1982 uh, LA mayor's race, we are Tom Bradley, a black man, was on the polls, going to win. Then some white voters hid their preferences, lied about their well, preferences, Amadi, and he lost dramatically. Amadi, and that has built into the idea that some of these are maybe you know, false, unstated, or invisible and illegible. Dr. Madi, well, thank you very much. We already ran out of time, but I like your reference to Dr. Uh, to Chief Amadi. Will it be right to address you henceforth as Dr. Chief Amadi? Are you a Gwefi or Nze? No, Doctor Doctor Abade, <laughs> Doctor Abade. No professor, no chief, no sir, no honorable. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, and thank you also, Professor Anthony Kila, for joining us uh, on the morning show. Time for a short break on the morning show. When we return. I have a rise news analyst, Mahal Afeni. Join us to review top stories in today's newspaper. Stay with us. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months. It doesn't matter if you run a salary account with First Bank or any other bank. Just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance, and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Crypto made easy. Lagos has amassed more wealth than any other state in the country to be the most comfortable city to live in. Now Lagos is earning 51 billion naira every month. But even with all that money, this is the Lagos you have now. Bad roads filled with potholes, poor drainage system resulting in floods during raining season, incessant traffic congestions, increased environmental pollution, poor healthcare system, large-scale child begging, poor security and increased crime rate, impunity of state government officials, lack of clean drinking water, poor transportation system. After years of empty promises, Lagos is now rated as the second worst city to live in the world. How long shall we continue like this? Lagos is not working. We want our Lagos back. Vote Dr. Abdulaziz Olajide Adediron Jandor as governor of Lagos State. Chafueko, fight for Lagos. BDP power to the people. The National Pension Commission PENCOM is pleased to inform the general public that the third edition of Pension Enhancement under the Contributory Pension Scheme CPS has been approved. The exercise is for existing retirees on the program withdrawal who have accumulated significant growth in their retirement savings accounts, RSAs. The effective commencement date of the enhancement is February 2023. All relevant retirees are by this notice advised to contact their respective pension fund administrators to complete their required documentation. PENCOM assures all stakeholders of its commitment to the effective, regulation, supervision, and administration of pension matters in Nigeria. Management announcer.
here on Arise News. Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Arise News analyst Emmanuel Ifini. Good morning, Great Malabite. Good morning, Ruben. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, sir. We start the review with this day, Nigeria's newspaper of record. Of course, the fallout of yesterday's projection by this day still uh, hugging the headlines, still the talk of the town, and of course, trending online. But the lead story of Baseki, Atiku, best positioned for Nigeria. Bajabia Mila, Tinimbu's record stands him out. Atiku's victory sure at first ballot, says campaign council. Yes, Atiku's campaign council responding. They don't believe that there will be a runoff. But time will tell. Of course, the projection is as of today. We've emphasized eight weeks, long time in politics. A lot can change. Uh, in the projection and depending on how the candidates uh, carry out their campaign and, of course, of course, realignment of forces, as we can see. Yes, um, Obaseki, the governor of Edo State, in that exclusive interview with these the newspapers, insisting that Atiku Abubakar, the candidate of the PDP, is in the best position uh, to govern Nigeria at this time. Will Nigerians agree with him that he's the best man to do the job and give him their mandate left to be seen? February 25 is the date. Of course, Bajabia Mila, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Mila, an acolyte of Asiwaju Bola, Ametimbu, you want to say, is one of those. Being referred to as those positions brought up by Asiwaju Bola Metinubu is insisting that Asiwaju Bola Metinubu's record, of course, it's record in Lagos, the, the, for, for effects, stand, stand him out. Well, those who live in Lagos uh, will tell you that where there was a governor, Bola Metinubu, and there have been governors before him and after him, you want to aggregate all the credits to one man, well, Lagosians will let Nigerians know on election day. Now, if we just move over to the Punch newspaper, PDP crisis, aggrieved governors may endorse Obasanjo's candidate January 5. Governors at London meeting vow to back Southern presidency. Name your preferred presidential candidate, PDP. There's angry governors. Good luck to Atiku. If he thinks he can win without us, but the judge, well, I would have expected that but chief, but the judge, elder statesman, should be thinking more of how to deliver Lagos to PDP. But we know that it's not even in good standing with the PDP candidate in Lagos. So even if the G5 make up with Atiku. Will Bode George not support the PDP candidate in Lagos? I think it's a question he has to answer. But the point is saying, agree governors may endorse Obasanjo's candidate. Who is Obasanjo's candidate? Former President Olusha Obasanjo, of course, received a number of presidential candidates in the past at his hilltop uh, presidential library in Abel Kuta. But his recent move when he visited Enugu to pay uh, his condolences to the people over the death of First Republic Minister um, it was in that, on that trip. There was Peter Obi. And some references, comments he made alluded to the fact that he's tilting towards Peter Obi. Now, is Peter Obi or Basanjo's candidate? Only the former president can answer that question in the fullness of time. But... If that is um, Obasanjo's candidate, are the governors, the five governors tilting towards Peter Obi, but the Daily Trust is reporting something else. Tinubu, Wiki's camp, meet to finalize deal on 2023. Pali, 
holds this week in Europe our decision to be guided by Asaba Declaration. Rivers governors ally. What is Asaba Declaration? Yes, the governors of the southern states once met in Asaba to say power must shift to the south. That is Asaba Declaration. Of course, many waters have passed under the bridge since then. Now, our decision, of course, to be guided by Asaba Declaration, we will respect all agreements as Siwaju's associate. G5 alliance won't affect Atiku's victory campaign council. Well, Peter B or Tinubu, who are these governors going to throw their weight behind? Are they going to return to the fold they belong and support Atiku? We'll see. Why London, the choice of their meeting, best known to them. Ruben, you put it aptly. The money spent in hotel accommodation, Esther code, could be well spent in Nigeria and bolster the tourism economy in this country. But these governors, they think otherwise. I don't see how London will make their decision more effective or otherwise. But that is what they have chosen. But Tinimbu or Wiki, will these governors root for Obi in the daytime and walk with Tinimbu in the night. Well, perhaps running with the head and hunting with the hound. You never can tell with these politicians. Now, the Guardian newspaper, Hope deems as 15.9 billion Naira air, la, Nigerian air lands in court. Mrs. Six take off. Federal government in desperate move to salvage on popular venture Buhari's 2015 pledge. Local airline operators, aviation unions divided on prospects. Analysts seek urgent review of model for sustainability. Ruto to sell loss making Kenya Airways. Well, the Nigerian Air, remember, it was once launched. Not, no, the logo was once launched with pomp and pageantry. All the somewhere in the UK. Why do they always go to UK? I don't yeah. wonder. No, it was a fan row air show they launched that. Yes, but, but they, also, they launched it. And they launched it with 500,000. Five US. Where? where? Where did that money go? Well. And the logo was something I can't even. But they still. People, uh, people said they can do it even on Corel. There drive. is still f uh, five months to go. So maybe one, this opportunity to salvage one of President Muhammad Buhari's, Buhari's uh, uh, promises. Now, the Nigerian Tribune newspaper, lawyer Bolanle Rahim, Buhari calls killing senseless mother in, mother in agony as Lagos government CP visit family. I hawked oranges to train her. President promises justice in this case. Well, still a very sad story. But the argument as to whether there's a nexus between poor pay and police brutality, I don't think that's logical. Uh, that's what we call causal fallacy, because poor pay, therefore, police brutality. But again, that's an argument for another I'm day. You are remembering your <laughs> philosophy classes class. in logic. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Ruben, you, know, you, you got the point. Yes, Ruben was uh, one of those uh, brilliant students who leave <laughs> theater as to come and take a uh, philosophy. First uh, class student. To come and take uh, <laughs> a elective in philosophy. No wonder Ru Ruben is so brilliant. Philosophy plus, of course. Other things he have garnered along the way. Now, the Daily Sun, of, of course, the same story. Buhari furious over killings of Lagos lawyer by policemen. Now, the foreign newspapers quickly will take the Times of London. Cabinet row over prevent anti-terror program. Yes, reforms delayed as Breverman and Gov clash. Breverman, yes, Sola Breverman, the Home Secretary, wants the report to be published, but... The um, Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for leveling up housing and communities, thinks otherwise. He wants to take well, charge of the list of and, of course, ensure that only Islamists are named in that uh, well, program. We have to go, Emmanuel Efeni. Time's taking. A short note to yeah. wish uh, Mr. Christopher Kolade a uh, happy birthday. He's mm. 90 today. Former High Commissioner uh, to the UK, former Chief Executive Chairman Cadbury PLC, uh, former Director General of the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation uh, Commission, 
uh, founding patron Nigeria Leadership Institute, former chairman of the Shopee uh, program and uh, teacher, author, and uh, an icon and a source of inspiration to generations of Nigerians. Happy birthday. Uh, Mr. Christopher Kolade, treasure. or more properly, Dr. Christopher Kolade at night. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we shall be bringing you a special report on security in Nigeria. Stay with us. of the Nigerian never say die spirit. They never stay down. You're always thinking of how to improve. You're always thinking of how to move forward. My name is Emmanuel Ahimieho. I've been a civil engineer for 18 years. I'm the project manager of Obadana Kaba Road. The Obadana Kaba Road is 43 kilometer built completely of concrete pavement. We started work on December 2016. I remember when we came here, it was virtually lifeless. We're building a road that we know will need very minimal maintenance. It's a road that we don't need to rush back to in five years, trying to carry out major maintenance work. We don't need to import anything that we need on the road. They are all locally available materials. All the cement we use on this road is from Dangote Cement Factory, which is the largest cement factory in Africa. The sand is from the communities, so people from the community, they end up becoming suppliers. Imagine supplying sand for a 43-kilometer road. It's a lot of money. There are things I've learned from building this concrete road that I never knew 10 years ago. And to be able to lead those people to achieve something worthwhile, something that is of value to them, to the community, to people who have never met us. And I am positive that the road will outlast most of the people who are building the road. Along this road, you have up to 12 communities. People have the confidence to open shops. Why? Because you know, someone is going through the road, they sell their things, they sell their goods. That is more money for them. We have a number of eateries now, and if you want to buy food along the road, you get fresh food, not food that are preserved, no. You get fresh food. So, it is good for us and it's good for the community too. The road is a lot more safer now for everybody, including Halima, including other travelers. So they have better road, lesser crime, shorter journey times, so a lot of advantages. I've had people who go through the roads and they stop to just say, well done. We are proud of what is happening here. We are happy that this is going on in Nigeria in our time. We can see it. They are proud of it. But I think it has brought life back to the communities. I feel very proud, extremely proud being a part of this project. This Naemeka, he like to keep money for her. A CBN deadline don't they near so. This one now, why is it maker? As he don't yet say deadline they near, he won't carry money good deposit for the right place. With access bank. It's time to spread your wings and fly. Reach for the sky. Even if the bank too far, now to go to the nearest access to that agent. Don't carry last with your money. Oh. <laughs> get up, get up right now. Money where you deposit for access bank. Now money where you go make your mind rest. Well, well. Don't let the money spoil for your hand, oh. Ten million naira today. Fifty zero naira tomorrow. Oya, Musa, Shade, Onye. Carry your money go access bank or access to that agent. Where near you? Access more than banking. New Naira Notes? Don't panic. Here's what you need to know. 
Ensure to make deposits of all old banknotes before January 31, 2023. To make the process seamless for you, all Fidelity Bank branches will be open till 6 p.m. on weekdays and 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays to allow for cash deposits only. Also, please note that bank charges on all cash deposits have been suspended by the CBN. However, charges shall still be applied on cash withdrawals. The new banknotes can be accessed at any Fidelity Bank branch nationwide from December 15, 2022. Old banknotes will remain in circulation till January 31, 2023, when they will cease to be legal tender, as directed by the CBN. For more inquiries, follow us on our social media channels or email us at true.serve at fidelitybank.ng. You can also call 0700 3035 or reach us on WhatsApp on 090-3000-5252. Thank you for banking with us. We are Fidelity. We keep our word. Introducing an all-time mega offer. Get over 50% discount in the Airtel Home Broadband Mega Offer. Buy a router for just 10,000 Naira and get up to 240 gigabyte or a MiFi for 5,000 Naira and get up to 125 gigabyte bonus data. More data, more you. Reliable home broadband buy. Airtel, the smartphone network. Getting together for the first time in years was uh, a little bit awkward. Grandpa still tried to entertain us. Mom was always in the spotlight from the kids. It wasn't until Grandma cracked a joke. That's my father right prayer. That we got back into our groove. In this festive, DSTV is making family time even better with an upgrade. Stay connected to DSTV and we'll upgrade you to the next package for free. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. As we wrap up the year 2022, we bring you this special report on security in Nigeria as we highlight some of our shortcomings in this year in securing lives and property and some measures the government put in place to tackle the issue of insecurity in the country. Twenty twenty two, there is the continuation of non state actors' activities challenging the supremacy of the state. The killings continued while attacks were targeted at government facilities, including security installations. Sadly, 2022 witnessed a series of daring attacks by non state actors striking fear into the Nigeria public that anywhere or any place within the nation's borders could be attacked successfully. The Nigeria Security Report captures uh, developments within the security sector across the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. What we do is to present um, a graphical representation of all of these developments. And what we've seen from January to December is about 11,000 fatalities which if you compare to 2021, is an increase. 2021, it was around 9,000, 9, and then now almost 2,000, more than what we saw in 2021. Now, we're not too surprised uh, because this is a pre-election year. Usually in pre-election years, all the structural deficiencies within the country that lead to insecurity are usually exacerbated. So we had anticipated this increase. What surprised us, however, is that a majority of the increase were from our security forces. 
so the fatalities had a significant portion that were the result of security forces op op operation. Um, also, if we break it down region to region, there were more um, fatalities in the northern half of the country than in the southern half of the country, which is not different from previous years. It was the same thing in 2021, the same thing in 2020. However, if you look at the percentages, what we saw in the whole of 2022 was a range between 80% to 90% in terms of the prevalence of these fatalities in the northern half of the country. Mm -hmm. So what this says is that if you address the security challenges in the northern half of the country, you are reducing the security issues in Nigeria by between 80 to 90%. The horrific attack on worshippers at the St. Francis Catholic Church Owo in our local government area of Ondo State, where more than 40 persons were killed and many others injured, fits the bill as one, if not the most worrisome attack of the year 2022. On June 5, 2022, gunmen with explosives stormed the church located in the heart of the ancient town opened fire on the congregation during a special service to mark the day of Pentecost and left behind tears, sorrow and blood. The attack made headlines across the globe, with people condemning the violence which was relatively unusual for the people of the southwest region. While ISIS claimed responsibility, some intelligence agencies suspect the Islamic State West Africa province of carrying out the massacre. Six months on, Although the chief of defense staff had announced in August that two of the attackers had been arrested, information obtained from them has not been made public. March 28, 2022, terrorists attacked an Abuja Kaduna passenger train. At the end, about 14 persons were killed and 63 officially declared abducted. The attack forced the Nigeria Railway Corporation to temporarily suspend activities while President Mohamed Buhari directed security agencies to rescue the victims. After the construction of the Abuja Kaduna Rail project at an estimated cost of $874 million in 2019, it quickly became the busiest rail line in the country and the most patronized government transportation facility. Following the release of all the abducted victims on the 5th of October 2022, security analysts suspect that over 6 billion naira may have been paid to the terrorists to set most of the captives free. Some families of the victims confirmed to Arise News that as much as 100 million naira was paid as ransom for a family member. While intelligence and investigations by security forces points to an unholy handshake of bandits cooperating with insurgent jihadist groups like Ansaru to carry out the attack, no breakthrough was made to arrest the captors. It is noteworthy that although the Department of State Services had arrested the publisher of Desert Herald newspaper, Tuko Mamo, who had previously negotiated the release of some of the victims, the service withdrew all suits against the ex-terrorist negotiator on Thursday, November 24. Credit must be given to the family members who put pressure on the government to ensure the victims are released. From the prism of our inability as a country to suffocate the um, threat perpetrators, uh, ransom collection is one of the easiest ways they, you know, as it were, uh, continue with their activities. If you are able to prevent them from collecting ransom, then automatically you would eventually suffocate them. If they don't have money to continue their operations, they would fiddle out one way or the other. Uh, so that was more or less the prism from which we approached that issue. The second one is the fact that our critical infrastructure, uh, something like a rail line, it is a critical infrastructure. Uh, it supports, uh, you know, the, the economy as it were. Uh, we've not found the right protection for our critical infra infra infrastructure, unfortunately. Um, and then the inability, as it were, to provide quote and unquote psychosocial support for the victims of um, you know, t security challenges across the country. Um, as far as we know, the vic these victims, uh, first off, the ones that were affected, about 60 of them, their family members 
uh, who were also in a way victims, were not aware that any form of psychosocial support has been provided for them. So they are living the trauma, experiencing it day by day, and unfortunately uh, life has kind of continued without anyone taking a step back to say, what are these people going through? How can we support them? How can we reduce the impact of this trauma in their day-to-day -day lives? So quite unfortunate, um, given the significance and the uh, um, you know, attention that that incident um, you know, generated. While the casualties were higher in several other attacks during the year, perhaps the most notable attack in 2022 was the Kujay prison break. On the 6th of July, more than 430 prisoners went missing following a raid on the Kujay Medium Correctional Service Abuja. According to the Minister of Defence Bashir Magashi, no fewer than 64 terrorist inmates undergoing trial for insurgency activities and others total 879 inmates were among the escapees after the attack on the facilities. Four inmates and a security guard were killed in the incidents. In the wake of the attack, 443 inmates were rearrested, while 14 more were brought in within the next two weeks. As the year comes to an end, the correctional facility has failed to announce how many of the escapees remain at large. The attack on Kujie uh, Medium Security Facility uh, was sort of an unfortunate incident, uh, knowing, uh, considering the fact that you know prisons actually is at the heart of the national security architecture of this country, because every other you know uh, uh, security agency has wanted to do with the prisons in terms of. You know, uh, knowing that prison is a holding facility, so it's actually a very sensitive thing that happened. It was a terrible thing, really, and I think that uh, it's one of those things that we, we never imagined that was going to happen. You know, because uh, you remember that we were told that quite a number of uh, um, hardcore or rather, you know, um, serious uh, terrorists, you know, that were captured in the, in the theater were brought down to that particular place, to that place, and, and they were held there. In the course of that particular breakup, those guys escaped. So now where, the, where they went, nobody knew. The impact of the Kuji attack was felt across the country, particularly in the Federal Capital Territory. The attackers had struck fear in the hearts of residents, creating panic that anywhere within the nation's capital could be taken. Following the Kuji attack, there was visible fear and frustration among residents. This was not helped by several terror alerts. The United States Embassy on Monday 24 October issued a security alert on elevated risk of terror attacks in Abuja. The British High Commission also issued advisory to its staff on movement while also announcing reduced services. Similarly, several European countries reduced services and only attended to critical needs. To allay the fears of citizens, security operatives took precautions including several exercises, show of force, roadblocks and even raids of several hotspots in the nation's capital. Most of these missions have restarted suspended services and no terrorist attacks took place in the FCT. Nigeria has battled insurgency for 13 years. During this period, the military embarked on several theater operations across all geopolitical zones of the country. While total victory is yet to be attained, there have been successes on various fronts. This includes the elimination of several terrorist and bandit leaders. Among several approaches to end insurgency is Operation Safe Corridor, designed to convince insurgents to give up the course. This is hinged on the realization that military response alone would be insufficient to dismantle terrorist groups. This is the anchor of the federal government's disarmament, demobilization and reintegration program. Consequently, this led to the voluntary surrender of a number of terrorists and their family members who were reintegrated into the society. As at November 2022, over 82,000 terrorists and their family members have surrendered in various locations in the Northeast. Um, for there to be an output, there must be an input. And the input in this case is the operational engagement. And the output has been this mass surrendering in your coinage of the Boko Haram terrorists. Uh, no doubt that um, a good number of them have surrendered, especially the fighters and then their families 
That's because we have had to engage in a series of operations, both kinetic and not kinetic. I mean, kinetic in this case, we're talking about brute force, having to use you know, hard power, military power, to, to force the wheel, to, to break the wheel of the insurgents and make them to conform to the desires of the state, in this case represented by the military and other security agencies. And so um, we have seen the impact, and of course they also, by their revelations, um, have um, you know, you know, spoken to the fact that um, the, the, the impact of our engagements has led them to give up the fight. And of course there are other non-kinetic means that we have used to also um, you know, influence some of those actions. So the, 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 the whole program to me is, is like putting side by side retributive justice and, uh, um, and uh, you know, how do you now make sure that those people have the, the encouragement, the motivation to come out even more? Because what we actually want is to make sure that we stamp out terrorism. And it's, most times it's not just the kinetics. It's not about the military force that can, can end them. Sometimes non-kinetic approach goes a long way. You know why it does so? Because this is idea-based um, you know, uh, uh, crime. It is not like economic plunderers who, who want to just, these, are, these guys are driven by ideology. So you need to really work on them to make sure that they, they understand the toxicity, understand the evil of, what they, of the association they belong. So most times it's not just, you know, some people just say, say why don't you just waste them? Why don't you? No, you don't do that. Otherwise, you will not have the opportunity to, to have, currently we have about 82,000, you know, uh, Boko Haram members and their families, you know, surrender. That is 82,000 less in the theater giving our troops some level of respite. Despite the perceived successes of the DDR program, many Nigerians have rejected the idea of pardoning terrorists who have taken up arms against the state. There are also reports that many who have been reintegrated have met hostile receptions at home. Away from the military action, on January 5, 2022, the federal government of Nigeria officially proscribed bandit groups 41 days after an Abuja court proscribed and declared them terrorists. This was meant to be a game-changer in the war against terrorism. Many attacks on communities have been attributed to bandits, especially on agrarian communities exacerbating the farmers' headers' clashes. With the law gazetted, the armed forces were expected to have the backing to deal a lethal blow to the activities of terrorists masquerading as bandits across the nation. While this has not been the case, the armed forces say there have been steady progress in reaching the objective. Another security challenge was with secessionist agitations. This is largely seen in the southeast with attempts by the proscribed group Indigenous People of Biafra and the Eastern Security Network enforcing the contentious sit-at-home order over the continued detention of the trial of the IPOP leader Namde Kanu. Although the security operatives hit several camps of the proscribed groups and neutralized a large number of them, the attacks have not ended. The government's efforts at addressing insecurity in the region using force have come under severe scrutiny. This follows the call on the government for the immediate release of the leader of the IPOP, Namdi Kano. In October, the Court of Appeal in Abuja, the federal capital, declared as illegal and unlawful the abduction of Namdi Kano from Kenya to Nigeria and quashed the entire terrorism charges brought against him by the federal government. He was therefore discharged and acquitted. Analysts say obeying the court order and exploring other non-kinetic measures would create a bigger room for peace. Well, let's start by tracing the history um, of those orders because the Southeast rightly feels marginalized in Nigeria and they also feel that their political elites, the lawmakers at the federal level and then the state governors do not articulate 
those issues as they would want to, especially in their engagement with our federal partners. And that gave rise to alternate groups who used the non-functionality of the Nigerian state and then the abysmal performance of Southeast political elites to carve a niche for themselves. And they began to talk about alternate political platforms. They began to talk about paint pictures of alternate uh, situations. And those things were then begun to capture the audience, the minds of the, and hearts of the people. Because you know any Dick and Harry can wake up and regurgitate the problems. But the question is, how are you articulating the solutions? So these people, their articulation of their solution to what they felt was a problem was that if you protest, they call it civil disobedience, by closing your office, closing your shop, that Nigeria will hear you. And they did it. And at some point, people voluntarily uh, complied to do sit-at-home orders. But eventually, people began to question the effectiveness of such orders. How are we sure that this is going to achieve us the attention we want? How has things improved since we started sitting at home? And people began to say, look, this is not going anywhere. And that's where you see the armed or violent enforcement because they have lost the credibility in the eyes of many. They began to violently impose their will on many by possibly sponsoring armed groups and other groups to enforce, kill people, maim people, loot shops, loot offices, burn down markets in some places. So the consequence is on the southeast that we lose, for some states, one out of every business day in the week. That's one day of no productivity. In terms of the economy, it has implications. That also has implications on the education sector. Because at some point, these people went to schools, burnt properties, attacked educational institutions, killed teachers, and terrorized students. Now, let's talk about <clears throat> you know, some of the suggestions you know, to end insecurity in the Southeast. Now, one of them is for non-kinetic measures to be developed and possibly see the government begin to negotiate or talk to these non-state actors. Well, how far do you think this will go in trying to resolve the crisis in the Southeast? It will achieve its purpose, but again, it will have other contributors that will help it achieve those purposes. For instance, good conduct and opinion poll you will see how badly damaged Southeast political elites are in the eyes of many Southeasterners. So to begin by confidence building, the political elite of the Southeast must so visibly engage and convince the people that they are working for their best interest. I will not mention any names, but again, if you ask people on the streets, this is your governor, what do you think about him? This is your senator, what do you think about him? You begin to see, so even if there is going to be a negotiation between Nigeria or and some parts of the South and the Southeast. Those negotiations are understandably to be led by elected representatives, elected governors. But when those governors don't have the mandate in quotes or don't enjoy the confidence of the people, then whatever you discuss there will not make me mean so much to the people. First, we will start by Southeast political elites realigning and repurposing themselves to serve the interests of the Southeast. On the political front, 2022 saw an increase in politically motivated attacks. These include attacks on offices of Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and on political actors. INEC in December said it recorded eight attacks on its offices in 2022. It is feared that these may likely increase as the political climate intensifies. There are also uh, uh, groups who we don't know what their interests are, who are hell-bent on sabotaging the activities, especially pre-election activities in the South. It's because if you triangulate the offices of INEC, for instance, that are being burnt, you then ask yourself, why then are they geolocated in one political zone? We have insecurity in the Northeast. We have insecurity in the Northwest. 
We have insecurity in the North Central. We have insecurity in the Southwest. We have even more insecurity in the South South, where you have oil facilities being attacked. Although there's a negotiated peace there, but you also know that you have non-state actors in their numbers still operating in that region. Why are INEC offices protected well enough in all these theaters, even theaters of confrontation? But when you come to a particular geopolitical zone, INEC offices are attacked. So you ask yourself, are there, who stands to benefit when INEC offices are attacked in one political region? Those answers are up in the air. In other geopolitical zones in the South, there were pockets of criminal activities along travel routes. Criminality by Heather groups in Undo, Delta and other states, as well as low-level political violence. Other threats in the region included the activities associated with illegal bunkery and other criminal activities in Bayosa and River states. Now let's look towards 2023. It is an election year and your organization is also predicting somewhat that there could be an increase in terms of insecurity. Definitely. Um, what worries us is some of the um, key things that could be corrected and that would allow uh, an almost immediate improvement in the security sector. Well, we've not seen that. And more importantly, and I'm not uh, having our bad news, none of the candidates that are campaigning for our votes at the moment are even speaking about those things. Um, number one is security sector governance. I had the good fortune of asking one of the candidates what he understood as security sector governance, and I was shocked that he didn't even understand what that meant. So uh, if we can improve on security sector governance, in other words, all the platforms that we have to enhance coordination within the security sector, because um, I'm one of the few analysts that will tell you I do not believe our challenge is numbers. I don't think so. I think we've got the numbers. What we lack is the ability to manage those numbers efficiently, effectively and efficiently. So if we enhance security sector governance, we are likely to see an improvement in the management of the resources that we have. If we don't do that, then even if you, like some of the candidates are saying, employ one million, uh, whatever, police, military, then it will be tantamount to using basket to fetch water or dropping a bucket because it's leaking and thinking it will stop leaking. So it's security sector governance, it's absolutely important. Number two, accountability. Um, how do we ensure that those that have responsibility for providing security and protection are held accountable? If I know as the next chief of defense staff or the next NSA that if I don't do my job, and that means I'll be measured in uh, a methodical manner, there will be KPIs, key performance indicators that will be developed and I will be measured upon that, then believe me, I would wake up and do my job. If I know that I can come and look at you and tell you, Freddie, I'm doing well, and you're not going to measure me using any metrics, then I'm probably going to do that. So we need to enhance accountability. Third point is we need to enhance coordination between the various sectors. Um, we have about 27 of them. If they don't operate together towards a single objective, then uh, unfortunately uh, we're going to continue with what we are. And then lastly is the adequate use of resources. Corruption is still a huge factor within the security sector. We have to block those schools. And that brings me to the point around suffocating all the threat factors. There are, according to the Inspector General of Police, 88 non-state armed groups that are active within the country. If we look at especially the monetary um, you know, sector of our economy and block all those leakages that allow them to continue to collect ransom, as an example, um, collect dues from villagers, and then the several other things they do to raise money. If we look at that, it will shock you that one of the bandit uh, leaders in Zamfara State has, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, a log logistics company that he's running and, and he's collecting money from that logistics company. How do we allow that, for, for God's sake? Cattle rustling, they, they rustle the cattle, they take it to Lagos, they still are able to sell it. So unless we suffocate them and block all of this things, 2023, unfortunately, is not likely to be very different from 2022.
The Zenith Better Life promo is back, and it's bigger and better. You could be one of 20 lucky customers to win 150,000 Naira every two weeks from now till January 31st, 2023. To qualify, simply open a Zenith Bank account and maintain a minimum balance of 5,000 Naira. For more information, visit www.zenithbank.com forward slash better life. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Flexing my brand new moto, my baby said she win me hobo. Festival of joy, glow promo, and my fans get fans with them still we go still. Even if light don't fan, we go still go. Hey, we now they don't cry, they don't carry lights. We the wind, so my light go still show. It's the festival of joy, joy, glow promo. Fashion killer, dress code bigger. So we machine for the glow festival But I just the win left, right and center That's the 611 Ash Go enter Festival of joy Oh yeah Festival of joy That's the 611 Ash Go enter Festival of joy Oh yeah Festival of joy That's the 611 Ash Go enter Papa, Mama this Lagos must work for all of us. Everybody die of Oh, yes, Lagos people. Papa, mama, sister, brother, auntie, plus including uncle them. Better don't land for Lagos State Gidiba. Money will be for Lagos State. Then go use them for Lagos State. Well, no more Baba Sope. Then no go chop Lagos State money. Nobody go pocket Lagos State. Then go take them, build Lagos State, build road, build hospital, build houses. And now only one man fit do this job. He name now Abdulaziz Olajide Adediron Janto. He can carry one of Bunga person as the deputy governor. Her name na Funka Kindele Jennifer. My people, what will they wait for? Make we vote for light, vote for change. Nobody can change where they vote before. This one na the original change. Hmm, how am I done do? Pay the pay. Imagine your wallet can be everything. Well, almost everything your bank is to you. That's exactly what First Money Wallet is. First Money Wallet from First Bank is another swift and seamless way to bank from your mobile phone. It doesn't matter if you have a First Bank account or not, nor the mobile network you use. Everyone can open a First Money Wallet and it's very easy. Your phone number is your account number. With First Money Wallet, you can send money using just a phone number, receive money, pay bills, buy airtime and data for yourself or someone else. And in check balance, you don't need a bank account at all or BVN to enjoy the boundless possibilities First Money Wallet offers. All you need is a registered phone number and you can fund your wallet easily through your First Bank account or any bank account and debit card. What's more, First Money Wallet is highly secure with fingerprint technology and PIN. And when you need cash, just walk up to any First Money agent near you to withdraw money. No smartphone, no wahala. Just dial star 894 star 1 hash on any phone. So, it doesn't matter if you live in the city or the remotest part of the country. With First Money Wallet, your transactions are easy, seamless, and secure. Download the First Money Wallet app now. Input your phone number and follow the prompts. Or simply dial star 894 star 1 hash. All money now on First Money. You first. First Bank. Crypto made easy. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat, 
So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the raw alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. Welcome back to the morning show here on our Arise News. Joining us now is Ojinika Ojiokwe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinix. Good morning, Dr. Marty. How are you this morning? Good, Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, Ojinika. I, I know you're getting into the Arise spirit now. <laughs> <laughs> you're understanding what Arise is. <laughs> how are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing today? excellent. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Ojinika. Well, well, all right. Good morning to you viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States, thousands of travelers are stranded at airports across the country as flight cancellations and delays continue to wreak havoc amid a deadly winter storm. On Tuesday, nearly 4,900 flights had been canceled. The chaos has left thousands of exasperated passengers sleeping in terminals as they search for solutions. In Nigeria, President Mohamed Buhari condemned what he described as the heinous and senseless killing of Omobolanle Rahim, the Lagos-based lawyer who was shot by a police officer on Christmas Day. The president, in a statement released by his media aide, Garba Shehu, said he was deeply shocked and saddened to learn of the brutal killing and directed police authorities to take the strongest possible action against the culprit already held in detention. Then, the Lagos State Commissioner of Police, Abiodun Alabi, on Tuesday paid a condolence visit to the mother of the slain lawyer who revealed that her daughter was her only child and was pregnant with twins before she was shot dead by the police officer in front of her family on Christmas Day. Bolanle's mother, while grieving, also said that she hawked oranges to ensure that her daughter studied law at a university. Under sports, 21 time Grand Slam champion Novak Djokovic has been welcomed back into Australia almost a year after he was deported over his COVID vaccine status. The 35-year-old Serbian arrived the country for January's Australian Open after his visa ban was overturned. In November last year, the tennis star was detained by the Australian Border Force on entering the country without being vaccinated, resulting in a visa cancellation. He was automatically not allowed to return to the country until 2025. Finally, under entertainment, tributes pour in for Joseph Marley, the eldest son of eight-time Grammy winner Stephen Marley and second grandchild of reggae legend Bob Marley, the Jamaican-American recording artist who goes by the stage name Joe Mercer, was found unresponsive in a vehicle on Tuesday, December 27th. Although a cause of death has not been revealed, the singer is reported to have died of an asthma attack. Joseph Marley was born in 1991 in Kensington, the third generation Marley who grew up surrounded by music. He began performing on stage at the age of four with Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers. He was 31 years old. So rest in peace. Let's begin what's trending with reactions trailing the decision by a number of Bologna businessman, Otto Eze, not to support Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi's presidential ambition. The businessman made the pronouncement during a festival stating that he cautioned the former Anambra governor to drop his ambition and wait for another opportunity because he will not win. Eze went on to say 
that when the time is right, stakeholders in the Southeast will back current Anambra governor, Professor Charles Chukwu Masoludo, as the chosen candidate of Igbo extraction to be Nigerian president, to be the Nigerian president. His decision follows Soludo's statement back in November when he said Peter Obi will not win the forthcoming general election because he does not have the requisite structure. In an article titled, History Beckons and I Will Not Be Silent, Part 1. Let's take some tweets. This person wrote, Same author Aze who declared that Buhari will hand over to Igbos after his second term. It's sad. The Igbos are the biggest barriers to their political potential. Thank God Peter Obi is not a regional candidate. Well, another tweet there goes, Otto Eze has distanced himself from Peter Obi's ambition, just like Charles Soludo. It might seem odd, but this gladdens my heart. It goes a long way to prove that Peter Obi is not an Igbo or a Nambra project. He's a Nigerian project. Over to you, Dr. Bati. Okay, first, uh, Chief Otto is a prominent Igbo entrepreneur who has also had very long-standing association with uh, politicians. But one thing that we must realize that he is speaking for himself and he has a right to choose his own candidate. And everybody should realize that he has only one vote. Just as uh, he as an Igbo person and Charles Soludo have said they don't believe in the candidacy of uh, Peter B. Uh, there are also others. Chimaroke Namani, Senator Chimaroke Namani, is supporting uh, uh, Bola Metinubu, even if he's in the PDP. Uche Ekunife is also not uh, supporting uh, Peter B. And then you have others like that, Charles Soludo. Oji Kalu is supporting uh, Bola Metinubu of the APC. So these are all prominent evils, making their own individual choices. Would uh, Ato Eze's uh, uh, choice in the matter, will it influence anybody? Will Charles Soludo be in a position to influence anybody? I don't think so. And, you know, some people from that Ofala festival that took place in uh, Duno Coffee, yeah, have, uh, have come, out, have come up to say, this is not the position of the people of Duno Coffee, and it's not the position of Igbos. And in any case, there are persons, also Igbos, who are also prominent and who have voice, who are saying we are supporting Peter B. On Twitter, I saw Francis Cardinal Rinse. I don't know whether he's the one using that Andrew or somebody using his name, saying that, look, 2023, what uh, Chief Arthur Eze has said is an indication that the 2023 battle will be a battle between the rich and the poor. Mm. And he advised people to use their PVC, to go and get their PVC and vote. If it's the uh, cardinal that is uh, truly operating that Twitter handle, what he's saying, therefore, is what we have consistently said here, that it is the people of Nigeria that will determine Absolutely. who will become president. It's not uh, one individual that will act like God. He, 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 uh, there's no, uh, you know, uh, head mentality in this matter. Mm -hmm. no, somebody cannot carry a, a one uh, of Allah, of Allah cap and say, <laughs> the, you know, don't we, don't, uh, we don't uh, support this man. There are others like Afamo Gene. Afamo Gene is an able man. He's uh, supporting P2B. Uh, Reverend Okechuku Obioha has also spoken up. He says he's, uh, he's uh, supporting uh, P2B. Uh, Chiveze has also spoken up to say he's supporting uh, uh, P2B. These persons that I have listed, they are no less Igbo than, Absolutely. than uh, Chief uh, Atoeze. But he has made his choice in the matter. And uh, the uh, P2B campaign has replied through uh, Dirone Fadi, mm. the spokesperson for the group. And he has said clearly that P2B is not running an Igbo project. Yes. That is running a na national project. Absolutely. He's not seeking to become president of Igbo land. He wants to be president of Nigeria. Yes. And it will be all Nigerians that will take a decision whether he should be there or not. So, and I hope uh, that uh, Chief uh, uh, Ato is against uh, that mm. message and will stop. Uh, uh, insisting that, oh, we have chosen our own president. <laughs> this same chief, uh, Atoeze, in 2015, supported Tony Nwoye, Tony Nwoye, for the uh, gubernatorial election in, uh, in uh, Anamra. Yes. Tony Nwoye didn't win. <laughs> in 2019, he, the candidate that he supported also did not win. Yeah. 
So I, I don't see, you know, this is just one of those things okay. uh, in politics. Okay, I, author, I, author, right, is, it, so, is considered one yes. of the kingmakers in Anambra State. I mean, what do you make of this pronouncement of him actually backing Soludo over Peter Obi as the next Nigerian president? He's not even, he's, yeah, he's, okay, Ibo of Ibo ex, yes. ex, 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 extraction. extraction yeah. He's saying that let Atiku go and then we'll hand over <laughs> to Soludo. And I was going, the first thing yes. that came to my mind is this presidency you are sharing. There is God, though. <laughs> Because I don't understand how someone <laughs> would decide that, okay, we'll give it to you first, and I'll give it to you first. Is that how elections are yeah. done in Nigeria? I'll just very quickly just mm. read a tweet from um, another Igbo man, Queen's Zimogalo, at least from that region. Mm. All presidential candidates deserve respect. Trying to delegitimize any of them is futile. Whether anyone thinks any particular candidate will win or not is simply personal opinion and immaterial. They have a right to contest. Only one will win, and guess what? Let the votes count and voters decide. All right. All right, we'll take another story. Following the outrage by many Nigerians over the killing of Lagos-based lawyer Omobolanle Rahim by a trigger-happy police officer who is currently in detention, a video has surfaced online showing police officers drinking on duty while dressed in military attire. The spokesperson for the Nigerian police force, CSP, Olumuiwa Adejobi, while reacting to the video, which was posted on Twitter, condemned their action, stating that the officers are not to drink on duty. While a viral photo has also surfaced online showing a police officer holding a cannabis crusher, the force PRO expressed his disappointment as he called on the state's PRO to fish out the officers and ensure they are disciplined. Rufai, we were only talking mm. about <clears throat> Mobile yesterday, and I think Ayo made that point about, you know, drunken police officers. This is what we are seeing here. Rufai, we have not finished dealing <laughs> with <laughs> Omobalanle's Lanley's death, and this video surfaces. I mean, Oji, it's a sad, sad video. I bet if they are to do drugs tests for most police officers on duty, I doubt if a lot of them will pass it. A lot of them are under the influence. They are good police officers, please don't get me wrong. But a lot of them are under the influence. That's why they will shoot an armless citizen. That's why they will do something like this. And I'm happy that they've been able to fish out, or they say they're going to fish out these bad eggs in the police force. Because a police force where people are smoking in their hem, they can't be right thinking. And this is not about payment of salary. Is it non-payment of <laughs> enough salary that is making this one smoke uh, Igbo Abishoko? Oh, you get, you, you can see him, and this one too, we call himself a police officer. That's why it even goes back to the recruitment. How, how, how did our police go so bad, so deplorable, that we now uh, employ people that smoke in their hemp? Look at this one, you see, you see that he's a seasoned weed, weed crusher. That's he is seasoned. Look at, see the way he's doing his hand. So that's the sad reality. And afterwards now, they will kill people. The police people will go and commiserate. Yeah. The mother will be telling you the pain. You'll be saying, leave it for God. Let's, we can't be leaving it for God. We have been leaving it for too We have been leaving our stupidity for God too much. That's why the country is not getting better. It's getting more stupid. A man is smoking in there, him drinking. You are putting gun in his hands. No checks and balances. He kills people now. They will say, is the, is the, is the hand, is God. What is God? It's not God. We are stupid. No ascribe for malice what you can explain with incompetence. I wanted you to touch on more. And you know, also we talked about Omobalanle's mother. Yes, she's that's the his only son. child. The only child. You see, and she said she was she, pregnant with twins when with she twins. was shot dead. And 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 she sold oranges to be able to take care of Omobola and raise her up to this extent. And we are consoling her, we are saying, please, she should leave it for God. We know it's God that console her, and we feel for the family. But when you now see pictures of police officers smoking weed on duty, Igbo, then you know you can't leave things like this for God. You, it's not about God. My mass teacher, Mrs. Brimo, we always say common sense is not common. Common sense is not just common here. What can we do? We need to reform the police force. It's not only about pay. It's about checks and balances. Who are their officers in charge? And, Hoji, I'm even more scared for the country. If you have a police force that a man, after 31 years in service, can still kill somebody the 33. way, 33 years in service, then what's the hope of the new recruits? If, if an ASP for that matter, a seasoned police officer, can have that kind of attitude? Well, if we check, if ah. we check the code of conduct, the police have a code of conduct. Under principle five, 
He says that a policeman on duty is not supposed to consume alcohol. No. You are not, in fact, supposed to come to the office to, or be on duty in the morning and they perceive the odor of alcohol. Hmm. So we hope that the police will enforce his own code of conduct Absolutely. and uh, ensure that these persons are appropriately disciplined. Yes, this has been going on. It's not only cannabis they take off. They probably take Fentalin. Oh, yes. They take Paraga at right. a police mm. station. Yes. Okay. If a policeman stops you, we'll be tied if you find a carton of a beer in your boots. Even if you say it's for your wedding, they will grab, they yes. will take a carton. They will say, uh, you should uh, take care of officers. <laughs> All right. It's well, true. Talk well, about that. Well, unacceptable. We shall take our final story, showing our gallant frontline troops sending their Christmas greetings to all Nigerians. You a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. A Happy New Year. I wish my son Apu a Happy Christmas. I wish my friends and family Happy Christmas and New in Advance. I wish my wife Aisha Happy Christmas. I wish my mother Hadija happy Christmas. I wish my children happy Christmas. I wish my family and friends happy Christmas. I wish my mom Latifat happy Christmas. I wish my wife happy Christmas. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. So Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I, I thought this was an excellent way to end what's trending Beautiful. today. Beautiful. It's, ten seconds it's great to see the human faces yes. of the military. It's great to see that they're human beings and that, you know, in, in, that we look after them, especially yes. at this special yes. moment. Merry Christmas to all the wives that they mentioned. Yes. His whole body. We know it's not easy, but thank you for your sacrifice. Absolutely. Well, thank you all again for your great analysis of what's trending. Well, that's all I have for you on what's trending today. I'll see you all tomorrow. And that's all on today's edition of The Morning Show. Rotus Odiri will be here next to take you through Global Business Report. Stay with us. It's the Arise News Channel. available to individuals, SMEs, and corporate customers. Download Vault by Polaris Bank from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today.
my brother, my sister. On a day, yeah, listen, make I clear on a well, well. To win election, no, be only say your vote na in plenty so before Pacific win election for we country. The person must win 25% of vote for two third of state plus the FCT for Nigeria. That one now for president. And governor must win the same thing for all local government area for the state. Now so our constitution put them all and now so all our presido take it become presido. All our governors not the same way them take win. So therefore, my people, our country big enough is small low, and we get different, different language, different religion, ethnic group, unko, that one self day nyafu nyafu. Now why nobody fit think say if you don't get not vote, I be sad to vote. East or West vote, you don't do. <laughs> now, nah, you except you collect vote from all over the country, you just do bubble yourself. Make you tell everybody, make everybody for no now. Make you for cause fight tomorrow. Na Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, with support from the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, bring on a decision.